and we are live good evening reds i hope you're doing well this is monday night and you know what time it is it's jarvis cocker's corner tonight we have a brilliant guest for you you have always me and Stu, but we have a special guest an x-man united player and we will ask him a lot of questions and get some insights in uh, what's going on about our club so uh, i see you in a bit after the intro there is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. If we wish to make it louder, we will bring up the volume. If we wish to make it softer, we will tune it to a whisper. We will control the horizontal. We will control the vertical. We can roll the image. Make it flutter. We can change the focus to a soft blur, or sharpen to crystal clarity. For the next hour, sit quietly and we will control all that you see and hear. We repeat, there is nothing wrong with your television set. You are about to participate in a great adventure. You are about to experience the awe and mystery which reaches from the inner mind to... Good evening, Reds, and welcome to Jarvis's Corner. With me tonight, I have uh, Stu Woolley and Phil Marsh. So uh, glad to have you on, guys. Uh, first of all, Phil, how are you doing? Yeah, all good. Thanks, lads. Nice to see you both. Uh, obviously, not been on for a while, but good to have a catch up with you both again. Um, yeah, everything's good, my end. Looking forward to having a good chat. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And as always, Mr. Wooly, 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 Stu Wooly, how are you doing, my friend? Yeah, I'm good, actually. I've had uh, quite a, a nice Easter with the family, so it's uh, it's all good. Uh, yeah, looking forward to... Uh, it's Timmy. Good off, uh, Timmy. Um, yeah, looking forward to uh, a chat with you guys again. It was uh, an interesting game, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Saturday evening, I think it's the uh, dividing the fan base once again. Um, people calling for Ten Hag out, people saying give him time. I, you know, you've got to roll your eyes sometimes and listen to opinion. And uh, yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, it's really strange, isn't it? Really strange. Yeah. Uh, big up Craig as well. Big up Craig Warby. Loads in the chat already. Have you noticed? Loads of people in the chat. I just want to say hi to everyone before we move on. I just want to start at the end, uh, at the beginning. And we have uh, Lilis coming in, Raya TV. D Hub Sports, Yale Malmin, as always, with his pepperoni pizza from Norway. Big up, Yale. How are you doing? And it's Timmy, of course. It's Timmy. Hello, good, hello, good Timmy. man. Good man. And mental ball game, as always, coming here with his mental health advice. Big up, uh, Mark. Uh, N is in the house. Jamie Wayne. Who else? Let me just scroll. And Neil Driscoll. Neil Driscoll, old uh, or young Neil Driscoll. Sorry for calling you old Neil. Uh, Ian McDonald, who else do we have here? We have a couple of new guys arriving late, but that's no problem. Lucky Singh, Danny B, and MUFC Realist TV. I, I bet that's uh, Mick who's watching the show. So uh, big up Mick yes. Ruby watching the show. Craig Warby in the house too. So uh, let's just go down to it. Stu, how was your weekend? Did you play any football in Easter or did you just have family time and relaxing? No, we've uh, the mighty Tipton Town uh, have got a bit of a break until we restart. So with the vets, uh, super vets as we are, over fifties, you have a two kind of mini season, so to speak. So we're in our little uh, a little break. So we're back in action, I believe, on the twenty first, uh, where the old captain's armband will be Ooh, tightened. As what usual. an honour! An honour. Swagger on like a peacock, as you do, you know. And uh, see how the old Phil knows what I'm talking about. He does the same. Swagger's on like a peacock. That's what we do, isn't it, Phil? You have to yeah, go. Oh, yeah, you've got it. Got a swagger you've got on. You look the part as well, aren't you, Stu? Even if you're right. right. You can't yeah, always yeah. look the part. You've got to look the part. Got to, got to look the part. The old Copper Mundials will, uh, will have a bit of a spruce up over the next uh, week or two. And uh, yeah, so looking forward to it, actually. I've missed it. I, I miss not yeah. playing. Um, I played during the week as well a couple of times. Three times mm. a bit, something like that. But I miss I miss 
the uh, the weekend football. It's it's all good. So I had to unfortunately sit through that dross on, on Saturday night, like everybody else. But a bit like you, Jarvis, I I saw it more your uh, through your eyes. Yeah. Uh, I, I I thought it was okay in patches, but only patches. Mm -hmm. And you're right about the. The, the yardage uh, difference again between midfield and attack was uh, was abysmal. Funnily, I was watching you on uh, Nuruddin's show. Yeah. You made a great point about playing two up front, and I made the similar point earlier. Uh, yeah, on yeah, yeah. Advocate. I made that. Yeah, but it makes sense. You know, you want to play with with the two up front when you play against the back uh, back five. You know, it's it's difficult. Hoyland was all alone all game, oh, and he yeah. lost every duel. And we tried to play through Hoyland every time. I think the stat said he he lost nine out of ten duels and and yeah. six out of seven aerial duels or something. So so it was totally wasteful just playing the ball to Hoyland surrounded by three centre backs and two full backs uh, tucking in. So uh, there was no space. So I would wish that was this was the perfect game just to try, for example, Maguire. Put Maguire up there besides yeah. Hoyland just to try to, to bully the three center back, just to get Hoyland some space so he could use his pace. Uh, yeah. How do you see the see the game, Phil? Uh, did you did you see it uh, that way, or could we done anything else? Yeah, no, I, I agree with uh, both both of your uh, points. Really, I think as you say. We didn't really ever get going in the game, I think, as you said, very disjointed. There was no real uh, rhythm and, and the gaps were always sort of too big for me. I think Brentford, you know, you know you know exactly what they're going to do, um, you know exactly how they play. And I think sort of the way that we set up and and sort of played the way through the game, it sort of just, you know, it, it, they, they sort of just knew exactly what was going to happen and then just we, we sort of played in, sorry, they you know, we just played into their hands and it, and it was sort of, you know, just a wave after wave, really. We, we, to be honest, I think, you know, when you get into a position in a game where you're still in the game in such a late stage, um, mm. very lucky to be in, you know, they had a lot of, you know, good chances, you know, they hit the woodwork twice, I thought. They looked very dangerous from set pieces, which is, you know, their probably main uh, threat. Um, yeah. And then to sort of score that goal... Um, against the runner player completely. Uh, it was a great goal, to be honest. I think Mount took the, the finish really well. Um, and then, obviously, to concede so soon after was just, you know, an absolute kick in the teeth. Although it would have been an absolute, you know, smash and grab to, to get the three points when we when we didn't deserve it, albeit. I think that is the most disappointing thing for me. You know, you, you've got away with one. you scored in the last minute. That's where you need that little bit of experience, a little bit of leadership you know mm. say you're, you're most vulnerable when you've you've just scored um and and you know time and time again that sort of uh seems to to sort of come in and sort of bite us and i think for me it was uh it was disappointing that that uh that that goal was was sort of conceded so soon after taking the lead i think you know that definitely left a, a sour taste in everyone's mouth i think even more so because of the performance but i think mm. obviously got the three points we, we sort of would have maybe not looked and analyzed it as much as we probably are going to do in, in, in sort of uh, you know the show today yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah but but phil you, you talked about it the the, the goal came uh, came so fast after we we scored a one nil up um as a, as a former player and i i'm a former player player myself um we used to always focus when we scored a goal everybody said to each other okay okay next two minutes focus focus you got to be prepared do you have the same same mindset do, do you remember from your days playing football you always yeah, focus yeah. on the same thing yeah no 100 percent, definitely i think you know that's that's something that's um you know talked about at uh, a young age i think that's you know any level of football i think that's something that uh, is just a, a basic rule, really. You know, when you concede, you need to make sure that you, you stay switched on in that, you know, next couple of minutes because, again, that's that's when you, you're probably at your most vulnerable. Um, so it was very disappointing. And, you know, obviously, with the experienced players that we have on the pitch, um, you know, it's just about we, we've, we've come up with these words, you know, game management and, and, you know, people sort of, you know, leading by example. And I think that's where really... Um, you know, certainly over the last couple of seasons, we've seemed to, you know, not have uh, any real people who can do that on the pitch on a regular basis um, and sort of take the ball by the arms. I think we, we sort of definitely need that 
uh, moving forward in terms of you know if we are going to get back to competing and being um, a top side where we're, we're competing them them are the moments in games where you need to have people in the team who can who can sort of you know read the game and just sort of understand at times you maybe need to take the sting out of the game or you know this is a moment in a game where now you know it's it's no messing about we're just gonna you know even sometimes i mean in football sometimes people would criticize for maybe going a little bit more direct but i think in times of the game you you've, you've got to sort of smell danger and sometimes you've got to think you know for the next five ten minutes we're going to have to you know turn this team and go along and just make sure we're not giving them any opportunities to get in and around our box yeah and again i think that's just about you know people sort of having that know-how and and um just being a little bit more clever really and i think as you say that's that's where we have certainly struggled and dropped a lot of points um over over certain games i can certainly recall yeah. where we've, we've not had that little bit of um you know experience where, where it's massively needed yeah it's true it's true i, I just i just want to bring it bring it uh, to back to uh, Stu because things like this we have seen it uh, before this season when we are up one nil the last minutes of the game is always hectic why don't we have the experience just to 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 bring it home you know because you see players are really stressed out they're not comfortable they're not composed when 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 the tough gets going and and it should be easier for them because we have a lot of experience with players on on the pitch we had the in in the last duel against tony the before the goal he had martinez and casemiro on him at the same time and 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 still we couldn't we couldn't uh, land it in a way yeah so that's the interesting point i mean uh, phil makes a great point about uh, game management in game management looking to smell the danger i i talk a lot don't i uh, a bit like a broken record um, that, that you should always be uh, seeing what's happening and what's unfolding in front of you, making those split decisions to stop attacks and etc. One of the interesting yeah. things that happened, uh, and, and it was a bit of a smash and grab, but I, I don't mind a smash and grab. Uh, I thought it was a well taken goal as well. But that's football, and you can, as long as you're getting yourself into that position and you take that chance, then it's unfortunate for for the uh, you know for the opposition. Um, Ipswich proved that today against Southampton. They kept driving and driving and driving and driving and driving. And eventually, mm. they got that goal. Now, the interesting thing, as bad as Ganacho was playing, uh, and as bad as Rashford were playing, actually, when you take Ganacho off, what Phil's talking about about game management is gone, because you've got somebody like Ganacho and you just run it into the corner, and that's what you need to do. That's take. That's how you take this thing out of a game of football, yep. or. Casemiro absolutely slams somebody into row Z, takes a yellow card. That's how you uh, nullify the opposition. You, you the know, dark art of football. Yeah, you forget dark football. Dark. Football, yeah. football. Football actually goes out the window. And, and, and you make that decision, right, lads, we haven't been in this game at all, really, you know, apart from the first 10 or 15 minutes where we played controlled football, um, slowed it down, played methodical ball. We've got this goal. We've popped off to the corner in absolute euphoria. And then our hearts are still racing at 160, 170 beats mm. per minute. And we're not actually thinking about the next phase of play. And that's what, that what Phil's really talking about, that next phase of play. So there are players in there. Uh, Steve Bruce was an absolute master of it. As soon as we got a goal, everything would just completely calm down. You know, you reset. You've got to press that reset button. Um, and that's how you that's how you do it. But Ten Hag, look, people were saying that, um, and I kind of have this argument with people a lot. Oh, substitutions either win or lose you a game of football. It's not really true. Uh, oh, Johnny Kay's in the house. Johnny Commode, mate, good to good to see you, pal. Um, but that isn't necessarily true. And Phil, I tell you, you get lucky with subs. You, yeah. you know, either a sub goes on and does. Uh, you know what Mount does and scores, or a sub goes on and he does F all for twenty minutes. So it's not a, a genius, a master tactician that makes the subs, etc. It's you look at your bench and you think who can affect the game. But actually, you took the man off. That if you really did want to get that goal tight up, you took the man off that could actually get you up the pitch and hold the ball up and keep the the ball in the final third rather than our final third and that i mean look phil's been in plenty of games and he's probably pulled his hair out where he's seen that you will have yourself jarvis 
but you know and and that that is the problem and that is where sometimes you've got to kind of get on um eric's back of it and thinking you're not utilizing the squad to its very best i like your idea of pushing up maguire absolutely um i said when i made a point that i wouldn't have bought martinez on i would have left martinez on the bench i mm. actually put casemiro in the back four uh, alongside Lindoff and I'd have bought on um, Amrabat. People will say, well, you don't know what you're talking about, but it would have made a difference because mm. Martinez, we know, just isn't match fit. And I want to talk to Phil about long-term injury because I want to mention my last year and Martinez. And we spoke, didn't we, um, about a week ago, um, Jarvis, where I said you should not bring Martinez back at all. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying I was vindicated by any stretch of minute, but that's what I was getting at. He was never going to be up to speed to, to, to tackle a full-on Ivan Tony, irrespective of whether you think um, Ivan Tony is a world-class player or not. You, you've just got to utilise your brain. And, and this is where this is where I get so fucking annoyed. <laughs> you know, I'm not a, a, a UEFA Super League coach license holder, whatever it is, what you know, I, I don't even actually, I don't even hold a level one in coaching. I just use my basic brains to understand football yeah. and deal with what's happening with you. And a lot of people will say, well, you can't just put square pegs into round holes. Now, Phil will tell you this because Phil's been there. I'm sorry to keep saying this, Phil, but you've been there. When you walk onto that pitch, if Sir Alex turned around to you and said, Marshy, I need it right back today. Okay, and he gives you six days' notice. What are you going to go and do? You are going to learn right back as much as you can within that six-day period. You are going to make yourself invaluable, invaluable and undroppable. So there's there's no issues by putting a player like Casemiro at centre-back, who's played centre-half before, and bringing in the type of player that Phil's talking about, something who's going to absolutely disrupt the opposition. And look, I... I, I you know, I'm a bit lost for words, really. As, I, as I'm talking, I'm getting more and more angry and frustrated about the basics that we all see, and he, and he didn't do that. So uh, that's, that's that's my thoughts on it, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just got a message from uh, from Tom. Tom, I sent you the link if you want to come on. Uh, so we just want a full, full panel. I didn't think Tom was around tonight. Uh, I just want to say to everybody that um, that we are doing a Q&A uh, at the end of the show. So if you have questions, get your questions in and I will mark them and we will and we will read them out uh, later at the, at the end of the show. So just get your questions in. That will be fantastic. Both to Phil Marsh, me and Stu. Uh, and we will try to answer as best as we can. Um, yeah. Uh, Stu, do you want to take the leading chair? Yeah, yeah now, now that we've kind of uh, got our frustrations out uh, about that game, I, I want to drill down into a few bits and pieces, actually, Phil. And one of those is um, training. We talk about training. A lot of the guys in the comments and in just general fan forums and fan chats absolutely are kind of, well, what do they do in training? Do they run? Do they do this? Do they do that? Now, as you well know, pre-season and first quarter of the season is completely different to what you'd see for the final third of the season. So can you just give us a, a, a Phil Morris day of, of, of what it's like to, you know, to get up, go training at the first quarter of the season and the difference between that and where we are today? Because I don't think, I, I mean, I don't fully really understand it. So it'd be quite interesting to have a, a you know a, a pros version of that if you, if you don't mind old friend yeah yeah no not a problem um so yeah i think um yeah as you say pre-season is completely different uh you're in you're doing um a lot of testing so you'll be getting uh your body weight your body fat uh you'll be getting all that kind of stuff the first couple of days that you're back in um and then obviously the first week you usually do uh, a bleep test just to sort of check your, your base level of fitness and see what you've been doing over the summer um and then yeah a lot of the a lot of the uh weeks during pre-season are, are sort of disguised running it's not all it's not all what people will think where you know you don't touch the ball and you're just running all over the place all the time and doing all you know stupid running uh exercises it's 
a lot of it is with the ball, but you're doing it for a bit longer than you probably would do normally during the season, or there's little stipulations that are put in within training. So it might be um, you'll do little small-sided games where you're man-to-man and you can maybe only tackle your particular man. So it's a lot of you know following your man up and down, making sure that you're putting a shift in. If your man gets the ball, there's only you can tackle him. So you've got to make a conscious effort to be, you know, making sure that your man's a not free all the time and getting on the ball uh, so a lot of stuff like that um and yeah i think obviously as the season then starts to progress and you start playing games um the the training schedule sort of gets more broken up uh, and and sort of you'll then start obviously incorporating the the gym work into that as well uh, so again during pre-season again you will do a bit of the gym stuff you'll be doing sort of circuits and um, we used to do a lot of boxing, actually, which I used to love. Uh, we used to do a lot of boxing with uh, Mike Clegg. You might remember sure. his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that was sort of incorporated into the, the programme as well, and then that sort of continued uh, into the into the season as well. Um, yeah, I think, obviously, f- from my memories, thinking back, a lot of the, the training that we did um, was was quite repetitive. It was, it was all... Um, a lot of possession-based drills, um, just making sure that you was, you know, good on the ball, you could play in tight areas, that you was able to keep the ball and, and sort of be able to play in that United way where, uh, you know, you was dominating possession. Um, and yeah, it, we used to always, so if we was playing on a Saturday, we, we'd always have like a, a just a, a morning. Like, so what we used to do, in fact, was on a Monday, you'd do a double session um and then choose so double session on a monday um because we used to go to ashton and mersey college as well so as a young um yt or young first second year pro when you join the club you you do two days at college as well the club was always massive on making sure that you got uh, an education as well so we used to do two days at ashton on mersey uh, a monday and a thursday uh, we used to go there and do sort of uh I think I did BTEC sports science and I did my level one and two coaching badge. So the club was always massive on making sure, you know, you had you had other qualifications in case, you know, injuries or you never made it uh, in the game. You mm. had something to fall back on, which was which was great, really. I think that was something that, um, you know, not a lot of the clubs at that particular time was maybe doing that. And I think United were probably one of the first to sort of get on board with that. And I think obviously a lot of them followed suit uh, not so long after that. So that was, that was really good. Um, and then, yeah, we, you know, through the week, you'd sort of do some days, you'd do a double session, which would be a session in the morning. You'd have some lunch and then it'd either be in the gym in the afternoon or you'd go back out and maybe do some small sided games. Uh, and then obviously as you get close to the, the weekend when you're playing the Friday, you'd just come in in the morning and it'd just be sort of like some small-sided chart games just to get your eye in and ready for the Saturday. And then, yeah, you'd have a day off on a Sunday. Um, depending on, you know, the schedule, sometimes you might come in and do a cool-down. Um, but, yeah, that, that was sort of generally um, the training programme. As you say, obviously, you know, sometimes it would differ depending on midweek games, you know, Youth Cup and stuff like that. Obviously, uh, going abroad and, and doing... You know tournaments and stuff obviously the, the the schedule would change um but yeah a lot of the training as i say was was quite um similar it was more about repetition making sure you know you was you was really well tuned into the way that the club was was trying to get you to play at that point if you was ever called up into the first team you knew exactly what was expected um mm. and i think obviously at that point you know when you when you're full time you, you sort of basic uh, skills are already fine tuned and polished. It's just about applying it into the, the style of play, then, really. And I think, obviously, from the under 17s upwards to the first team, we all played the same way. Um, they all wanted to, you know, be dominant in possession, get the ball out wide, get balls into the box, you know, and just and just what basically smother teams. And I think, you know, every, obviously, you know, I'm only speaking from my experience when I was at the club and you know, we was very successful every age group when when I was there. Every year we seemed to have, you know, very good uh, success in, in winning leagues, winning cups, you know, going in tournaments abroad and, and being one of the best teams. Obviously, you play, I mean, I used to love, you know, going abroad, playing against 
other teams. I remember going abroad and playing against like your Real Madrid and your Barcelona, and it was a different test. I think obviously more technical, and you know, obviously a lot of them games where you you used to playing against teams in your own country where it's more physical and teams you know want to try and put tackles in and be a little bit more. That was a bigger test because they're more technically gifted, you know, little one twos, nice you know passing triangles. So it was great to have that experience of going abroad and, and sort of playing against different teams at that time and, and, you know, seeing different cultures as well. It was brilliant. Yeah, no, I can believe it. I, the interesting, uh, just a big welcome to Tom. Hope you're well, mate. Yeah, evening, gents. Hope we're all doing evening. good. Evening. Evening. Good, man. Thanks for joining us. Just a, a follow-up on that then, Phil. Um, there is always a huge outcry um, when Manchester United lose, uh, whether or not we are coached properly. Now, you just made a quite a startling point, really, which I think will open up a lot of fans' eyes, that it's not necessarily always about coaching. It's more about, again, you'd already honed your skills, but it's more about actually playing the way that they want you to play. So could you just let people know the difference between what you've just described and how they perceive coaching to be? Because I've always argued this, or it's always yeah. said that when you are there on a daily basis, coaching is is very, very small. It's all about drilling, uh, mm. you know, certain patterns into your brain. Can you just give people an idea of what that difference is? Yeah, I, I think, to be honest as well, Stu, just, just to touch on that, I think, obviously, going back to the times when I was at the club, um, I think the players more so sort of, I think, obviously, Sir Alex will have had a certain way he wanted to play. He would have had his coaches that would have spoke to the players and said, you know, this is the the way that we want to play. But I think more so back then, the players was that good and, and sort of that, you know, on, on a pitch, they could just get thrown onto the pitch. Sir Alex would say, this is the way I want to play. But when you're actually on the pitch as a player, sometimes you've just got to, you know, go out there yourself and, and sort of, you know, things might happen and you've got to be able to know how to react, how to adapt. You know, when a situation arises, how do I, you know, react in that situation? And I think because the players were so good, um, we, we never really got as much coaching as what I presume the players this day and age because now, you know, when, when you look at it back in the day, the players were 4 4 2. If Roy Keane went forward, you know, Paul Ince would sit in and vice versa mm. or whatever, mm. you know, just, you know, whereas now it's, I think there's, there's too many, you know, this player's here and he can't go out of this area and he, he manages this space and, you know, that, whereas back when I was there, even, even at our, you know, age groups, you know, you was told to play in a position. But if you wanted to come inside and, and, you know, switch to the opposite wing, that wasn't a problem because other players would see that and they would just shuffle across and adapt to it. Whereas I think nowadays, because there's so much sort of sports science, there's all the scrutiny on, you know, this player does this and this. And for me, I, I just grew up in that era where the, the, the coaching was there to help you and to try and give you a, an idea of how the position should be played. Mm. But, you were sort of left to your own devices and, and yeah. you learn mm. the job as you go along. And I think because we were so successful uh, and, and we was, you know, in a side that was, was winning and we had really good players and everything was going well, we never really got to a point where we was getting coached that much because obviously, as I say, everything was just flowing nicely. You know, we never really sort of, got to a point where we were struggling for a long period of time so we maybe needed to change something or how we was going to play or a system or you know a player maybe was having a you know five or six games where he, he wasn't playing well so we, we'd maybe say you know we'll put you somewhere else mm -hmm. I, think, I think that is just maybe because the time I was at the club it, it was maybe slightly different I think obviously now players probably look at this first team and think what's going on like why are the team not playing a certain way you know we expect them to have a philosophy or a style of play and from one week to the next we're not seeing it but I think that's again you've got to look at all the obviously injuries you know certain the, the manager wants to probably play a certain way but because of the amount of injuries that he's had mm. uh, I think he's, he's been sort of a little bit unlucky with, with that to a certain extent However, I just think there's a massive gulf in, in the level of 
of, of players and, and the ability that we've got currently to what mm. you know you know the fact I've seen previously. Um and again that comes down to the player just having a little bit more you know about them to, to sort of manage the game within the game. So when you're playing certain things might happen. I think because they're so regimented now with, with where they need to be and you know this is my space and I can't really whereas I was never grew up in a, a situation where I was told you can't go into this area. You know, this isn't your space. You're just here, and that's your job. We we all sort of had a little bit more freedom to to mm. do our own thing, and I think that benefited us massively. And I think that's where uh, the modern game is is sort of you know slightly different. And I, I, again, I, I look at that and think it's you know. I would probably struggle, to be honest, in, in this sort of way of playing because, as I say, I, I loved having that little bit of freedom and being able to mm, do what mm. I wanted. It. And then, obviously, you know, at times you, you think, OK, you know, I don't want to, you know, go maybe too far across the pitch and, and leave a massive gap because sometimes, you know, things might happen and then you've left a massive and you let, you're letting the team down to a certain extent. But that would never happen because we had players in the team that would, you know, make sure that you got back into position. Whereas I think, again, mm. that's a thing at the moment in the, in the current squad. I, I don't think we've got enough leaders that are, are sort of communicating and passing that information on probably in the right way or, or quick enough to, to make a difference on the pitch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's probably the best way I could explain it. I say it's, mm. it is uh, hard to, to sort of um, compare because I think the, the sort of, Eras are very different, and the game has has changed so much. Mm -hmm. uh, look, totally agree. I'm going to bring Tom in in a minute, but you see, I I was brought up with that exact way of playing, Phil. I was brought up with it. If you were to uh, run 10, 15 yards, invert yourself in, and somebody would come over and they recover, um, whoever that may be, uh, be, be you know behind you. And you know, football has changed. Uh, pitches have changed. Boots have changed. Balls have changed. Sports science has changed. The actual fundamentals of football hasn't changed. It's ultimately still the same as what it was when somebody first kicked a ball centuries ago. You know, um, and and this is where I struggle. I'm a bit like you. I, I there's no way I could get to grips with today's game. You know, all right, admitted that we could get away with clotheslining in somebody. Um, you know, back then you can't get away with it today. I, I'm not so sure that's a, a, a good thing or a bad thing. What I am noticing, though, and this is why I want to bring Tom in, I am noticing, I, I think the, the the number nine is coming back. And I think in 18 months' time, you'll see the re-emergence of two strikers again. So what does that tell us about football from yesteryear to the so-called FIFA generation to football of the future? Because ultimately... It doesn't change. Uh, Tom, just what, what's your thoughts on just what Phil's been talking about and your thoughts maybe uh, where football may or may not change moving forward? Yeah, well, I think football's, you know, taken a massive um, push towards the future. I think when you look at recruitment and in, internally inside football clubs, it is run based off of data and, and analytics. You know, stats plays a, a massive contributor towards just even just your scouting network when you scout for players or even you know when you look at football from maybe a couple of years back it goes away from maybe you look at players on a on a youth field or you know on a town counties match or, or whatever that is and you actually assess it more based upon the data that you have at your disposal when you look at you know for example how a lot of the big football clubs are operating nowadays it's not necessarily based upon, you know, word of mouth and you hear, oh, this kid's a, a good player or, you know, you have a recommendation of a player. It is more based upon that the stats almost put the argument forward for players now. And I think, especially within sort of personal development of football, you know, technology is always going to move along with the times. And I think people are having to necessarily adapt to technology and use it in a way where, for example, now, if you're a football player inside a football club, it's not necessarily like a manager would pull you in the office and say, you know, this is how you need to do it. They'll actually show you it on, you know, tactic screens, analytic there. Or that, like you say, with some modern day managers, for example, we spoke earlier on a previous show about um, what Deserve does, for example, at Brighton. 
where if he doesn't like something in his training drills with his players, either it be tactically or actually in getting the stuff across to the players, he stops the whole training drill and he'll assess it straight on the spot with the player. So in terms of the way that analytics runs internally in football, I think it's almost pushed football forward. And, you know, just off of what Phil, Phil was saying really about in terms of the development of the game really going forward from maybe what it was years ago. Yeah, you can't get away with, you know, fouls and, you know, almost the, the hard man routine of, of football where, you know, you go two footer into a tackle. Yeah, you might bring somebody off on the other end of things. You know, you even just touch a player and you see it in the modern game. It is almost like football has gone soft. That's the that's my feeling anyway of how I've looked at it. And, you know, they bring in, like I said before, with modern day football, VAR now, it's almost being used as a questioning tool to put against referees if they don't get a decision right or, or not. But I think really in football, it's almost as if the... Listen, clubs, players, managers, everybody's having to adapt with it and go with it. Managers of the past who've won everything, for example, like your Mourinho's, your Carlo Ancelotti's and stuff, when they used to recruit players years ago at Inter Milan at Porto, it wasn't run off of analytics. It was run off of what they saw in a player when they mm. saw them either play against them and they say, listen, write the players number down. I'll speak to them at the end of the game. You know, as many people know about the Solix figures and story with Cristiano Ronaldo, when he came to the football club. And obviously, when you look at how young players are maybe brought in more nowadays, for example, if you take what happened with Alejandro Garnacho, where we brought him from another academy, those academy products aren't necessarily what players look at, where you have a person at the side pitches and you actually look at a player. It's run off of your data, it's run off of your analytics of how you get players and you learn who are the best talents out there. And if, like I say, we look at football from how it was maybe in the past it wasn't run more based off of technology in many senses, it was basically your eyes and who has the best eyes in football. And maybe, maybe you look at, for example, the success that Manchester City and Liverpool have had more so based upon how their departments are run up with their structure in comparison to the past. Manchester United have had two people who were massively influential in the success of the club and that was Sir David Gill and Sir Alex Ferguson. That partnership you know, spearheaded United for years of success. But it's not necessarily when you look at football now and you look at, say, Manchester City or Liverpool, it's not the manager and then just a CEO or a, a director that run it. There's five, six different departments that have to have a hand in how a football club is run. There's your mm. recruitment, there's your youth system, there's your first team. And mm. it all has to culminate into one to be successful. But like I said before, guys, we, we've football it change it changes so long as life goes on and everything's gonna have to change with it players managers you know football you, even young players will have to start looking at it and thinking maybe at home instead of maybe thinking it in my head about what i could do differently maybe i have i don't know software or you know analytics that the manager gives me clips or whatever and I could look at it myself in my spare time and say, all oh, right, if I'd have run five yards further, I'd have not conceded this goal. Or fine margins in football, especially mm. today anyway, dictate really where the game goes and where it doesn't. And ultimately, when you look at, say, for example, what history has shown us, if, maybe I don't know, for Manchester City's case, if Sergio Aguero did go down in football with the last-minute goal that he did, because he was clipped by a player, if he'd have gone down, maybe they wouldn't have scored on that day. Maybe they wouldn't have won the title. Who yeah. knows? But like I say in football now, if that situation happens in the last minute of a game, most likely with how football has changed, you'll have a player go down in that circumstance. Because it's the last yeah. minute of a game. And if you can get a spot kick for it, and technology will prove you're right, you're going to go for it, aren't you? But yeah. like I say, I think football, in my opinion, I think it has gone soft from what it has been in year, years by anyway. But if everything's going to have to move along um, for football to succeed in terms of the technology and everything, then you're going to have to, you know, knuckle down with it and make sure that it's used appropriately. Otherwise, we won't be having discussions about VAR every single week and offside systems and everything with, ref with referees or players getting fined for doing X, Y, Z, managers. Like I say, if you have a clear, clear outline of how football you know, wants to be for the future, 
like I say, older style of football, we all know the, the hard yards of it and everything. Everybody's heard of it or seen it and whatnot. And we can see where football's going nowadays and how it's completely different. And it will only probably develop even further later down the line. And maybe, who knows, one day you might have a football match where you don't even have a referee on the field. And it might just be solely run on technology. So well, that's, we, that's don't, we don't on. know at the end of the day. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that's probably coming. Um Jarvis, just uh, your thoughts yes, on the uh, the coaching conundrum. Well, are we talking about coaches training or or? Um... Yeah, a little bit. Like me and you've had a conversation in the past, haven't we, about you know coaching and how I feel. Yeah, but, but I, mean, I listened to what Phil uh, had to say, and and he mentioned a couple of things. But I think football hasn't changed that much. Yeah, maybe it's more specific now and and people are getting told what to do but i think a lot of the creativity is is, uh, is away from football as as we were used to and and when, when i was playing you know roaming out of position was no problem and and mm. and when player came into my area it was my responsibility to find new space and contribute for the progress of the team always yeah. i had to think I couldn't just think okay i'm i'm uh, i'm a left winger now and if someone came in my area what can I do? I had to move out and find new space. And and this is, you know, you had to be creative in a way. And you had to think more older in, in old school football. I think now you are drilled to do this. You have to do this. If he comes here, you have to go there. It's it's not, it's everything is instructed in a way. And I don't know if that's better or worse for football. But the, for me, I, I think, I think I would love to see more creativity coming back. Players making agreements. Okay, you come here, I will go there. Why not? But we hardly see it in, in, in this team. Uh, what do you think, uh, Phil? Yeah, I, I was just I was just actually thinking then as you was uh, as you were speaking just about. Um, so when just just to sort of put into context this. So when um, I was told that I was going to be making me debut for the first team. Obviously, I'd been training with the reserves and, and all this, and I'd been at the club obviously a long time. Um, and you know, someone just put in the comments there about obviously all the teams used to train and play the same as the first team, and uh, obviously under Brian McClure, we we would uh, you know basically replicate the, the sort of style of play that the first team had, and, and a lot of the training drills were probably similar as well. Um, I remember thinking, obviously, when I was playing in the reserves, even in the reserve team, you know, we, we was never really told that much. We, we was just told this is the way we play, you know, it, basics. If someone as a centre forward, if you're playing two up top, if one of you comes short, the other one's in behind. Um, mm. As a fullback, if, if one, if, if the winger, um, you know, the fullback goes around the winger, the, the winger sort of drops in and, and all this kind of stuff was just yeah. second nature. We, we didn't need to be told any of this. Mm. Um, so, so when I came over and I, I was training with the first team and then I was obviously told uh, that I was going to be starting, I, so I basically trained for a couple of days with the first team, did quite well, and then the, the managers just sort of said, uh, right, you know, you're going to be starting up front with Alan Smith and uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Uh, so I was like, oh, like, brilliant. Absolutely, you know, buzzing, made up, couldn't believe it. Uh, and then in my head, I was going home and I was thinking, Oh, right, like obviously made up. I'm going to be making my first team debut. Um, I wonder what I wonder what Sir Alex is going to be like with me, you know, in in the game. Like whether he's going to be telling me, you know, I need to make sure I'm, you know, if we're playing three up front, I'm playing central. I'm going to have to be on the tucking in. I'm a, I'm a you know, all all these things were going through me. Yeah, because I was thinking, obviously, first team is going to be completely different. It's a different, you know, ball game, different kettle of fish. A um, couple of days before training, we trained. Nothing else was really said. Again, you know, just left to your own devices. Um, and then the, the day of the match, I'll never forget it. We, we had a about a two minute team talk, and, and basically, there was, I think there was four or five lads making the debut that day as well. Like I was one of them. There was there was three or four of the lads making the debut. Um, mm. So I was expecting, you know, obviously we're playing away from home in a cup game. You know, we've got you know four or five young lads that's making the debut. So it's obviously you know going to be a bit nervy, and there's going to be some you know inexperienced lads who's obviously making the you know the first team. Appearance. So I was expecting him to be, you know, this is what I want you to do. Make sure, you know, when the ball's here, you're here. Da, da, da. Not, none of that. It was just all he said, short and sweet. He just was like, um, you know, 
you're here on merit, lads, so don't you know worry about a thing. Just go out and express yourself. And that was pretty much the, the team talk for us. We wasn't, we wasn't told anything defensively. You know, there was no clipboards with, you know, when he's here, you're there, and all this, that, and the other. It was go out, enjoy yourself, express yourself, do the, yeah. just do what you've been doing. Because, because as I say, it had been drilled into us from such a young age. Mm. This is where you play. And again, it's all basics. Football's a simple game, really. If if you don't overcomplicate it, you know, you know all the all the little um, patterns, all the stuff, you know, basic stuff. If if you know you're playing up front, you know, someone, you know, you might want to interchange. So I, I think I played on the right hand side um, of the three. Uh, Ollie played down the middle, and Alan Smith played off the left. But during the game, you know, you've got that license. If I wanted to go central, Ollie pull out to the right and. You know, Smithy come inside, and Ollie might go out to the left. All that stuff was just common knowledge and basics. And and I think nowadays there's there's a lot of managers and there's a lot of teams that are trying to overcomplicate and and probably do too much mm-hmm. of the tactical and and that yeah. side of things. because I think the the older generation of player was just drilled and so used to playing in a certain way, and they knew that the players beside him would cover the, cover him if he yeah. went forward knew that he had the the player that would have the the brain and the the knowledge to think right i can't go forward now as well otherwise we leave a massive gap whereas i think that's now that there's a lot more confusion because there's so many instructions there's so many you know specific probably information that players are getting so a lot of it you can understand it to a certain extent why some of the players are maybe a little bit apprehensive at times to to probably do what they probably want to do or you know, maybe some of them aren't capable to do it, but they're being asked to do it. And that's why I think we see a lot of the indifferent um, performances, especially uh, at the moment with, with a lot of the injuries we've had. We've got certain players who I think aren't up to the task, really, if I'm being brutally honest, of, of sort of the job that the manager's probably asking them to do. Mm. I mean, that's, that's really interesting because most fans and the perception is that Sir Alex, you can't go rogue in a game of football. I'll tell you what to do. This is what you have to do. I talk about it a lot, Jarvis, again, and, and Tom will both back me up on this. I always talk about you having to go rogue in a game of football. You have to. You have no choice. If you are regimented, you're going to get turned over nine times out of ten. If you don't use your brain, your intelligence, uh, you know, to get yourself out of a hole, uh, to be able to find space, to be able to penetrate the opposition, you're not going to win games of football. It's that simple. And I've always said this um, mm. constantly, and I have this argument with people all the time, that there is a, a small amount of coaching that goes on because they have to trust the players. Yeah. The manager cannot not trust you. You know, mm-hmm. when you walk over that white line, okay, that's it. The gaffer can't do fuck all for you. You're the only one. So if you're the one that makes up, yeah. uh, who puts a 10 yard pass, uh, you know, five yards, or it's a hospital ball, or you're playing it into the wrong. Uh, side of the player or, or this you know all this you know which whether he's a left foot or a right footer you know where he wants to take the ball you know Roy mm-hmm. King knows exactly where Phil Marsh is going to run you know all this you know because you're spending you know eight hours a day with each other during the week you, you, you're practicing short drills so you know you can tell already mannerisms uh, of, of, of your colleagues and this is what football's all about and it so gets washed over oh you know, coaching this, coaching that. Honestly, it does my fucking head in. It really does. I'm glad you've been able to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sort of, I think uh, I think you've done there, Stu. In, in terms of you know, in a nutshell, Sir Alex. To be honest, you know, and and the general consensus I got when I spoke to first team players that he never really used to say a lot. He, he used to just keep everything short and sweet. Obviously, if you if you're playing in a in a, a big game against a, a big club and there's certain players at certain times who are, you know world-class players they might have a specific plan for a certain player um like obviously when they played barcelona messi you know yeah. part, did a good job on him so there, there is always little bits that they, they will say but i think because united was so good uh, in that era and they were so dominant and all the players had the respect and everybody was sort of everything was drilled into them that you know as i say it just became second nature and there wasn't really much that needed to be said it was just as you say you're with each other all the time everybody knows the roles everybody understands that you know if someone goes forward the other one's got to stay you build up them partnerships relationships even the lads that aren't playing 
you know, they're watching that from the side and knowing if I'm coming on as a sub, that's my job, my role, my responsibility. I've got to come on and do a job. And everyone was pulling and, and, and sort of, you know, moving in the same direction. And I think that's why the club was so successful. Whereas obviously now we're, we're sort of in that transition period still because we've we've not had the right recruitment for me and we've not been bringing the, the right players in who want to buy into that um, mm. sort of mentality and, and sort of have the, the sort of mindset that you need to, to play for Manchester United. No, I totally agree. Uh, guys, you're getting a real insight into professional football here. If ever you're wondering what it's like to go training, if you're ever wondering, you know, what actually happens in a professional elite football club, you're getting it, you know, here from, an, you know, an ex-player. Great stuff, that Phil. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Jarvis is even cracking a smile, so he's well happy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm super happy. Look, there's absolutely tons of you watching. Please smash that like button. Um, it really, really helps with the algorithm. It helps grow the show and it helps us, you know, uh, you know, to, to hopefully get people like Phil on the channel, you know, who can give you this, uh, this wisdom. So we were talking about Sir Alex, um, Phil. So I've got to ask you, um, most people would say that 100% he's the biggest influence in that club. Absolutely would agree. But there's somebody else that would have influenced you just as much player wise or somebody within the group whether it's a coach, ex-player or not, who, who was it, you know, particularly for you? Who was that man that, per, apart from Sir Alex, you would look up to and think, you know what? Uh, yeah. yeah, no, uh, for me, it was uh, Rennie Muhlenstein, 100%. Um, I think, obviously, he, he worked with me as a young kid, um, sort of, not a lot, but he used to come in and do a bit with the academy on all the sort of technical skills. I think, obviously, a lot of people have seen the, the video with Ronaldo and Jesse Lingard and stuff where he does the, the sort of little workshops where you're just working on your, your fast feet and moving the ball and, you know, step overs and stuff like that just to get your sort of uh, movements and your, your sort of uh, ball mastery type of thing. Uh, so I, I'd worked with Rennie um, as a young kid and as I uh, sort of went full time uh, and he, uh, he had more of a, a sort of um, impact on me just personally. I, obviously, Rennie was somebody who would... If, if you ever wanted to maybe do a little bit extra or if there was a part of your game where you maybe needed to improve on or if there was something that you was unsure about, he, mm. he would always be the, the person for me who I would uh, would go and speak to because I, I just, you know, I, I knew how much he, uh, he he was respected by everyone at the club. I think his um, he sort of coaching uh, repertoire that he had was, was outstanding, you know, and I think for me, uh, on a personal level, um, especially when I got into the reserve team and, and sort of was playing in a few different positions. As I say, I was somebody who would, um, you know, if the, if the manager, whoever it may be, asked me to play right wing, right back, centre mid, up front, I, I'll do a job, doesn't matter. I'm not going to spit my dummy out and be like, oh, I'm a striker. So what you, I used to just, right, that's fine, crack on and I'll, I'll do a job there, not a problem. Um, and, and Rennie, to be fair, was somebody who, because that was sort of something that I yeah. took, yeah, yeah. Any, so I I took that upon myself because at the time we had a few injuries and mm. uh, we, had a, we had a lot of um, centre forwards and, and stuff at the time. But I think Rennie uh, actually had the conversation with me uh, on a, on a private sort of basis and just sort of said because uh, I feel as though you, you've got the all round game to be able to play in any position on the pitch which, you know, some of these other players wouldn't be able to do. So, yeah. for example, at um, a point in the season, we had two or three lads who'd got injured. I think a few had gone on loan and we didn't have a right back in the reserves. Um, and Rennie was sort of a little... Because at the time, I was the top scorer. I, 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 was, I was playing really well up front and I was the top scorer. You know, the strikers was like myself, Giuseppe Rossi, uh, Fraser Campbell. So we had a, a great array of, of striking talent and options and um, I was the top scorer in the reserves uh, and, and Rennie pulled me and was like I might need you to do me a, a job at right back and I was thinking at, at first I was a little bit oh, like I'm you know I'm top scorer I'm doing really well I'm, I'm playing great <laughs> oh, to play right back. but, but um, he, he said it in a way not, not as in you know the way if, if he'd have just said to me like Marsh, yeah, you know, you're gonna to have to play right back uh, next game because we've got no one else. It, it wasn't, it wasn't put across like that. He sat down. He had a 
20 minute conversation with me about how well I've been doing um, up front. You know, you're doing brilliant. You know, you, you start knocking on the door at the first team and, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. I think you're a great lad. And anyway, and then, and then he, he sort of like just eased into the conversation of we're struggling a little bit. And because of your, um, you know, all round ability, he said, I think you can, you know, travel with the ball. You've got pace, you've got a great passing range. You know, you, you, you're good, obviously, in terms of your back to goal. He said, but I think, you know, you can definitely do a job in that. Because at the time at United, as a right back, you weren't doing that much defending, to be fair. We was, you know, up and down, getting balls into the box. Um, and he said, because you play as a centre forward predominantly, he said, you, you, know, know, what yeah. you know what kind of service that you want to see. He said, and I think, you know, you'll do really well. And he said, obviously, it's only a short-term thing he said just see how you do if you enjoy it obviously brilliant and you know if you need any help with the defensive side of things you know you've got Paul McShane you've got Johnny Evans you know lads who you can you know learn off PK shock all these lads you know you've got lads there you can you can sort of tap into on that and it, it, I never forget it my first game I played I played right back we played uh, Leeds United at Hyde um, and I got man of the match I got two assists um, yeah. playing for right back so Amazing. We yeah. um, no, it's a great story. I thought we um, spoke a few weeks ago about putting an Anthony at left back, and I was quizzed on why you would do it. And I made a very, very similar point. And that point was, Anthony will know or should know what the attack is going to do, and he should be able to um, preempt it and block him. Should be quite straightforward. But as we know, football isn't like that. Tom, quick question to you, uh, and then same to Jarvis. I'm listening to Phil. I know you've just been out, but. I hope, you, I hope you pick most of it up, but do you think we've got a Phil Marsh type attitude player in our current squad? I don't know. It's hard to, it's, when you look at what we saw against Brentford, it's, it is really hard to, to say yeah. it. I mean, maybe a couple of the young players, you could make an argument in the case for Garnacho, I think has got the, the right mentality to play for Man United. He's got the attitude, work the work ethic and, you know, we even saw that with the Liverpool game. When you play 120 minutes, you're probably shattered. And the kids played so many games all season and everything. It's been relentless for him. But he still found the energy to have that last burst at the end of that game. I look at players like that, they have the right sort of mentality and mindset to, to play for Man United. And I do think I, I could, you know, make a case for those players almost being the future. Progression for even young players who are looking up from the academy and thinkers of the Sens, who can I emulate? Who can I can I aim up to and push towards? I mean, e even if we're um, looking at, you know, other examples, I think, you know, Kobe Minor as well, with the progression, you know, a couple of players had, had put some quotes out there. I think it was Ivan Tony actually, that put a, a quote out there when he was saying at 18 years old, I was sat at home playing Xbox while this kid's 18 years old playing for England. So, you know, there's... Um, there's, there's players who you can always see, at, at, um, not even just at Man United, but even at, at every club, that you can see that they get what that club means. Because it's not necessarily, like we say, when we go on about tactics and you know analytics and how you use you know, formations and shapes and everything. Sometimes it is literally just about showing that you actually give a damn. Even, like I say, in the, the dark moments that Man United have had in some games. For example, like, we lost 7-0 to Liverpool last season. There was one player who, in that game, he come off the bench and he got, you know, was just cracking Liverpool players. But he actually did something and he actually showed a bit of heart and desire. And that was Hannibal Mesbra. It's yeah. players mm -hmm. who maybe have a little bit of a highlight or an influence like that. And you think to yourself, listen, if it's not going well for you, it's better to do something than do nothing. And that's always what I always look at in football. Listen, you're either good enough or you're not good enough to, to play for a big club like Man United. You'll get given the time. But fan, fan, fans are, you know, we are human. We will give people time and everything. And we can understand with certain circumstances with players when there's allegations or personal problems, you know, outside of, you know, the actual tra the training complex and the actual club itself. I can understand that if you have personal issues and that. That's fine. Yeah. But when it actually comes down to, you know, the nitty gritty of it, the best case for when you see if you've got the right players in your team is when you're in difficult moments, because those players will shine through while others mm. will just be not will just be completely by the wayside. And I think if we can base it off of how many young players we actually have in this team right now, 
I think that shows really that Man United are probably relying on what they have in the youth ranks more or less than they've been brilliant recruiters in the transfer market because they've been shocking with money. They've been absolutely shocking in terms of spending it, negotiating for players and getting players in because they've been the wrong characters and it's not worked out. But in terms of the young players, there always every year seems to be that one player who has that bit of a highlight and then they might get a couple of games or whatever. It was Garnacho's year last year. We had Marcus Rashford's year a couple of years ago and Lingard got his opportunity. There's always that one player who has that bit of a breakout. Mason Greenwood had it and you can say the same thing for Kobe Mino this season as well where he's having his opportunity. And Like I say, there's always going to be a couple of players, especially from the youth ranks, that's why I always think a youth system in a football club is just as important as having players from overseas or, you know, just recruiting players from other football clubs. Because at least those players have been brought up through it. They've spent years in the system and they really know what the football club means to them. They might be fans of the club themselves or whatever. So they'll know the meaning of it. But like um, Phil was saying before as well, when he, you know, touched on it before, I think even when we look at this squad right now, it just lacks leadership. It lacks leadership. Yeah. It lacks, it, you know, we can say what it is about quality and stuff and that we're not, you know, getting anywhere in terms of results or performance at this you know, point in time. I also think that even just if you look at credentials of leadership, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, like I said, a couple of, you know, weeks ago and stuff, put out um, quotes and stuff where he was saying, like, he offered the captain's armband to players around the room and he said, you know, do you want to stand up and be Man United captain, even if it's for one game? And they turned mm. him down. And it's like, yeah. you shouldn't have a dressing room of, of players who don't want to be the captain. If anything, you should have a team of 11 players that want to be a captain at Man United. That's really how it's always been born and bred. You learn from a young player mm. off of, you know, the old guard, if you like, and then you take on that mantra and that role model sort of leadership going forward. But it doesn't always necessarily happen. And, Listen, you have different personalities and characters in your dressing room. I can understand that. But the far and few between in this group of players right now, and even when we have it, guys, when we discuss about it, when last year Maguire was stripped to the cap, Harry Maguire was stripped to the captain, so we were sat there at you know, twos and fours saying who should even be the captain. And we all come up with a different name. In any football club, it should be set as a precedent. Oh, so and so is the captain. Liverpool, it was never an argument for nearly six, seven years. John Henson's captain. That was the, that that was always been the same way. City, it was the exact same thing. Vincent Company's always the captain. That's how it should always be. You should always have that leader. And you might have a couple of players who are that leadership group around the squad. But we lack that at the moment in time. But there's only a few, I would say, young players, maybe in particular in this first team that we have right now that are showing any sort of desire, fight or anything. But if you show the bare minimums, I'll get behind that as a fan. But there's an expectation for a lot of the more senior players in the team. I think it has been an absolute shambles mm. for the majority of the season. But mm. who knows with the new ownership coming in, they might look at freshening things up and rip it all apart. We don't know. We don't know how these people think or anything. But by the looks of what they're doing off the field anyway, where they're ripping people out of football clubs left, right and centre. Seems Who knows to... what they might do with the playing squad? And it mm. seems to be that they are elite operators and they want to work with what they believe is best for Manchester United in the future. And I'm, I'm sorry, if you're looking at the qualifications of what they're doing off the field, they can't be happy with what they're seeing on the field with some of the players. Or even in hindsight, maybe even with the manager in that case, if they look at the coaching. But like I say, we have to see for the future and stuff. But I think the youth play is a massive factor in Man United going forward because mm. it's what's been bred internally in the club for generations, really. Mm. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, the youth, the youth, youth is the future for the club. Uh, <clears throat> before we move on with the next question, I just want to shout out marty mufc coming in they said great show gents a lot of uh, other channels are getting boring with concept manager out uh, player out rhetoric this is very insightful so yeah thank you marty this is what we are trying to do on jarvis's corner we're trying to have a a, a broader debate and and talk about football uh, as we as we know it uh, not all this uh, tabloid stuff. So um, thank you, Marty MUFC, for the great yeah. shout. Um, 
Phil, uh, we, we talked a little bit, uh, you talked a little bit in the beginning of the show about training. And, and I have always, I have always uh, thought about how is training going on uh, at the professional level. And my question is, did you ever, uh, did you ever at Man United adjust your training regime to peak the form during a specific period of the of the season or a run of games? Um, um, I think, right. yeah. I mean, to be honest, we we, we never sort of had. Um, a sort of different schedule as such. I think what what a lot of the players used to do was um, we would, if if for example maybe you got given a little bit of free time or there was maybe um, a little bit of scope where you could go and do your own things. Um, I was I was one who was uh, always quite into the gym, trying to physically develop myself, make sure I was you know strong and and sort of. I did a lot of work with Mike Clegg on sort of uh, reaction mats and making sure that I was quite uh, explosive, you know, over that first 10, 15 yards. Because um, especially after it, so after I had my accident, especially obviously when I was coming back, because uh, my my main attribute really was my pace um, and sort of, you know, just sort of my pace and my power was, was sort of always my two um, main sort of attributes. When I had the crash and I was out for 12 months, uh, I obviously struggled uh, for the first couple of months as I was getting back into training, uh, confidence and sort of trying to strengthen myself back up to, to the levels that I was before. Um, <clears throat> I then had to sort of like make sure I was doing extra in order to get myself back to, you know, where I needed to be to be able to compete and be able to get myself back into to contention to be playing because otherwise I don't think if just doing the normal training would have, would have probably been enough for me at that point. Um, and again, you know, other players I used to see doing that as well, you know, other players who maybe, you know, lacked in a certain area uh, or maybe needed to develop a certain part of the game or something like that would always, um, you know, do that a little bit extra. I think the culture at the club was was just different back then. I think everything mm. was sort of encouraged and, you know, you wasn't, um, you know, ridiculed as such if you was maybe, um, you know, wanting to better yourself. Um I think that was something that was embraced and I think everyone sort of got on board with that, which was which was great because as I say I I definitely needed it in that period when I was coming back from um you know my my sort of long term injury because otherwise I probably would have never never have you know got back to, to the level that I needed to be at to, to be at United really. That's a great question from Jarvis. I've got a follow up to that, Phil actually. And it's probably involves Tyra uh, Malassia and also um martinez a little bit I, i've often spoken about a long-term injury um uh, and when you come back you don't realize there are certain aspects of your body that are a lot weaker than what they were before because they're having to take the strain of the injured uh, appendage or muscle and that did you suffer from something similar did did, did you notice i for example if it was your right leg that was injured that your left leg was a lot weaker uh, because it was putting on, uh, you know, more prone to injury because it was putting on more of the strain. Did you notice anything like that? Or Yeah, no, definitely, 100%. I, I definitely did. Um, I think because, obviously, when I had my car crash, it was basically, it was basically the full left-hand side of my body. Um, so from the top down, um, was was basically, you know, broke. So I broke my leg, I broke my shoulder, my arm, um, all the left-hand side of my body, basically, because that was the, the, the sort of side of the car that took the impact. So... A lot of my work when I came back um, was was sort of trying to just strengthen them muscles back up in the left hand side. Um, I actually remember I couldn't I couldn't lift my arm up for about eighteen months. So because I'd broken the scapula, which is sort of like your wing bone at the back, yeah. uh, I couldn't I couldn't actually lift um, any weights or anything for for about two years because I just really couldn't put any full uh, strain mm. through that left hand side of my body. So obviously, when I did start eventually trying to get myself back into it, I was I was naturally just a lot weaker on my left hand side. So the weights regime that I had to do was sort of very very light weights uh, and just more repetition until I sort of built that back up. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it was yeah, just just obviously you know them first few months when I sort of came back from that injury, just because obviously the nature of the injuries and obviously you know being a young kid and going through something 
so traumatic mentally and physically. It was it was quite daunting just going back to training, not knowing if I was going to be the same player. A little bit worried about going into tackles and and just didn't really feel myself until obviously then. You know that's when all that extra hard work and and sort of grit and determination comes into play, and you've just got to. You know, no one else can do it for you. And inevitably, the, the physios and the, the treatment staff are brilliant with me. Uh, give me all the, the stuff that I needed. But obviously, you've got to, you know, want to do it yourself. Um, and I knew at that point, you know, in that couple of months that, you know, just just doing the, the normal training sessions and, and sort of, you know, a couple of sessions in the gym every now and again w- was never going to be enough, really, for me to, to get back to where I needed to be. So... That was the point then obviously i i knew that i was going to be you know having to knuckle down and, and having to do you know extra sessions and, and make sure that i was uh you know up for a, a sort of uh, a bit of a, a grueling um schedule until i was back to sort of a, a period and, and a feeling where i knew i was back on track and then i could just maybe tone it down a little bit and, and not have to do as much yeah i, I think a lot of a lot of people don't Maybe don't appreciate uh, body balance. Um, you know when you when you destroy almost destroy half of your body yeah, yeah. to get that balance back up with your right side. It's the timing yeah. for the perfection yeah. where it comes together is is not impossible, isn't it? When I mean, do, I mean to be honest, like, yeah. To be honest, Stu, even even now to the present day, like even when I when I go in the gym and stuff, and if if I do ever, I mean, generally I don't really lift heavy heavy weights. Like I'm I'm not trying to be a, a bodybuilder or anything. I, I usually just do uh, moderate weights, more repetition. I, I want to try and stay lean. But if I do ever do any heavy weights, I, I can still feel that I'm a little bit weaker mm-hmm. on my left hand side just because um, I don't think that I'll sort of ever, ever no. become fully because of the sort of nature of the injuries that I had. So, you know, that that's something that a lot of people probably don't see when players do have, you know, really bad injuries. Um, and they, they do obviously come back. They, they, they will probably never ever be exactly the same as what they was before the injury. You do get back and you can sort of overcome a lot of injuries and, and some people go on and excel, but others, you know, might not. And, and I think that's a massive, uh, you know, thing that sort of a lot of people do miss out on because uh, it, it is tough. And as I say, some people haven't got the the, the mindset to to want to do you know all that extra work to get yourself and give themselves the best chance. So you know mm. it's just about, it comes down to the individual really in them in them moments and, and how hard you want to you know work and, and and sort of you know put the you only you only get out what you put in really in them sort of situations. So mm. no, that's a great, brilliant insight because again I, I spoke about Martinez. I would have left him. I left him away, you know, just to stay away now to the end of the summer. Well, I did my quad in. I think it was about 46, 47, and I, I tore my quad. Luckily, uh, I didn't tear it uh, completely, but it stretched as far as it could possibly stretch. And I remember the physio, say, the physio saying to me, he said, well, look, you're either going to get lucky or unlucky. And I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, either the, the, the kind of muscle's going to connect properly or it's going to connect on an angle, and you'll know if it's connected on an angle because you'll get a little dent in, in, in your leg where your quad is. And luckily, I, I, you know, I got it. But you said if you get that little dent in your quad, you'll never, ever kick the same, run the same, mm-hmm. walk the same, because it's not that you haven't got the ability. Your brain won't allow you to do what you used to, to do. Um, and so... My other follow-up question to that is, and you kind of already answered it for us when you're talking about being in the gym and and feeling your left side being a little bit bit weaker. Where was the mental issues that you had when coming back from that? You already spoke about walking into Carrington and thinking, Jesus, am I going to be the same Phil Marsh as I was two years ago? Or am I going to be, have I got to reinvent myself? Where where were you mentally with that? Yeah, it was, it was tough. It was really, I mean, it was really tough to be honest. Obviously, you know, being um, out for so long, and then obviously coming back to the club, and obviously I was in a wheelchair to start with for for a few weeks and uh, months, and then I was on crutches. I was in a brace. I had a, I had a sort of leg brace on, um, and I remember um, after sort of about six 
eight months of me uh, recovery, I started coming into Carrington a little bit more and, and doing a lot of stuff in the, the pool, like hydro rehab, like in the swimming mm. pool to sort of help, um, you know, with the resistance type of thing. Mm. Um, I, remem- I remember like this, like it was yesterday, and the, the physios were sort of saying, right, we're going to go for a walk um, on the grass, on the pitches outside. And I was like, I was still on crutches at this point, by the way. Uh, and it was Richie Merrin, actually, who's the first team physio now. Um, he was like, yeah, we're, we're going to go for a couple of walks around the pitch, just just see how you get on. And I was thinking, I can't put any weight through my foot, Rich. Like, it's, it's agony. Like, honestly, he said it's killing me. Um, so anyway, I, I went out on my crutches and uh, we got out to the pitch and I just looked at him and I was like, honestly, Rich, I can't, I can't do it, mate. I can't, I can't put any weight through me, me foot. It's, it's unbearable. Um, and he just, took, he just took the crutches off me and was like, no, we need, we, you, you're ready to do this. Like, we need to get you around this pitch and uh, mm. we need to be cracking on now and getting you back, uh, you know, where you need to be. Um, and honestly, that, that, to be honest, it took me about five minutes to sort of walk about four or five paces because I was just so scared and so sort of yeah. insecure about what, you know, he was asking me to do. Um, but it's like little little things like that where you think, you know, there's nobody else who, who's going to do it other than yourself. And I think at that point um, and, and a few other moments in my rehab where I sort of was just like, you know what, I, I need to just grip my teeth, get through it and, and make sure that I give myself the best chance because I knew prior to that injury, the progress that I'd had mm. from such a young age, you know, obviously I, we've talked about this before, Stu, about yeah, yeah. playing. I was playing two age groups above. There was only three of us who got a contract and went full time. Um, I was captain of the, the youth team. I'd, I'd made the reserve team debut. Um, so at that moment, when when obviously the crash happened, it probably couldn't have happened at a worse time for me because I was doing so well and obviously everything was going you know brilliant for me. So I knew obviously if I was going to get back to anything like that um sort of trajectory that i had in terms of me progress and where i was heading um i needed to make these sacrifices and i needed to make sure that i gave myself the best chance so mm. yeah it was difficult i think obviously mentally coming back in and, and knowing that i weren't physically ready uh in that couple of months where i said obviously i knew that you know after being out for so long you know lads are all fit and sharp and i was sort of like well off the pace you know, not not sort of anywhere near it in terms of you know to the level that they was. It was it was difficult because I knew when I was training that like I was sort of sticking out a bit like a sore thumb because I knew mm. I just uh, I wasn't you know physically, mentally, and and sort of uh, match fit. So then mm. that was probably the most toughest uh, months for me when when uh, I I had to come back from from that period, but. As I say, um, there was no one else going to do it for me. I had to make sure that I did everything I could to give mm. myself the best chance. Obviously, the coaches and the, the physios was, was great with me and, you know, always was encouraging me and just making sure I had the best um, treatment and stuff. So, again, it's just down down to yourself, really, and, and, and doing, um, you know, what needed to be done. And, and that's what I did. And as I say, once I, I got myself back and I felt, you know, a lot fitter and sharper and more strong than the muscles and mm. sort of started to come back you know that that's when you know the confidence then starts to come back i did i did lose a little bit of the pace which i knew was probably going to be the case because of the injuries that i suffered yeah uh, again I, I just adapted my game a little bit more and started to um you know pick up little pieces of other people's games where i thought you know what you know started watching other players like rooney and, and people like that who you know he, he was a similar build to me i mean i'm not not putting myself in the same bracket as wayne rooney by any stretch but i was a similar player to wayne in the fact that i could drop in i could play in behind I was, you know good off both mm. so i started learning and watching other players and thinking what little parts of their game can i take and try and you know put that into my game to, to make me a better player and, and give you know defenders other problems that you probably wouldn't have been you know used to prior to, to, to the injury yeah 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 um i just want to follow up on on, on that uh, before we move on um 
Uh, Trevor Wade uh, has a question and Mick Ruby too that uh, is on this topic. But first of all, I just want to ask you a little bit. And Georgie Best as well. Uh, he's got, yeah. got, a, got a question on this topic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I just want to want to ask you a little bit about the mental game when you're out with an injury like this. You know, how did you did you like stay determined to to come back or did you ever doubt yourself and think this will never happen or because you know I, I think it's like a roller coaster when you go through something like this yeah. how how did you stay in balance what did yeah, you no, use to no, do? Def no definitely definitely i think there was there was definitely moments in uh, in that period of time that i was injured that I, i was you know questioning whether i'd ever play football again uh there was there was moments where i didn't think i'd ever come back and get to the levels that i was prior um I think a lot of it came down to yeah, I had I had a lot of mental strength myself, but obviously you have good people around you. I had, you know, really good uh, friends and family and the club. Mm. Everybody was really positive and and you know, as I say, it was it was a difficult period because it was so long and I, and obviously it was you know it wasn't just one injury; it was multiple injuries that I was having to come back from. Um, so obviously it took a little bit longer than than um, I would have liked because. Obviously, you know when you, you, the, the club <coughs> look after you in the best way. They, they make sure that everything's done. There's no stone yeah. turned in terms of you know what they'll do to get you back on the pitch. But uh, I think because mine was such a drawn out process, and obviously the nature of, of how it happened and the public sort of um, side of things, it was it was a little bit more difficult in terms of just being able to to blank everything out and just try and think that you know everything was going to be back to normal as soon as i was back it, it wasn't as straightforward as that but yeah it, it was hard as i say you know people talk about mental health and, and stuff like that now in in this day and age whereas you know back then there was there was never really anything uh that was that was there for people who might have been struggling or had a little bit of uh you know insecurities or you know things on the mind and I, I definitely sort of, you know, in that period, I had dark moments where I was thinking I'd never play again, what, you know, what I was going to do, hmm. how, how sort of something that was going so well can just turn and, and be basically keep away from you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it was very difficult. But as I say, I did have a lot of good people around me and, and um, they were the ones who, was, you know, kept drumming into me, that, you know, you'll be back, don't worry, you'll, you'll, make, you'll make a full recovery and... Uh, you'll you'll get you'll pick on again from where you left off, and again, mm. you know, I just had to I had to just hang on to that and believe it, and and obviously that's that's what I did, and as I say, it wasn't easy. It was a it was a long road back, and I had to make a lot of sacrifices um, and do a lot of extra hard work to to get myself in a position where I could, uh, yeah, where I could just get back in and and sort of, you know. Feel, feel like I was part of the group again, if I'm honest, mm. because I made them first few months. It was it was really hard because I knew, obviously, the lads were great. Being back in the changing room, you know, all that side of things, like, you can't beat that. But I just knew that I was sort of nowhere near the, the, the level. And when we, when we was training and stuff, I was feel, oh, I'm like letting people down because I can't get, to, I can't close someone yeah. down as quick as I want to. And I'm a little bit, tentative because i don't want to go flying into a tackle like i probably would have done uh because i'm i'm sort of you know not in a mindset where i feel comfortable at that moment in time so as i said it was it was difficult but again the lads were brilliant and the coaches so i got to that stage you know after that period and and you know it just sort of all fell back into place and and luckily for me i did make a, a, a sort of full recovery albeit i, I wasn't the same player I had to adapt the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Trevor Wade comes in with the question, and and he just asks simply, "How far do you think you would have gone without the injury from the crash?" And and he says, "Just to, just to get to, to play professional football in itself is a high standard. Never mind, cut down in your prime." So, have you ever had in in retrospect had the time to think of this? How far yeah. you would have gone? Yeah, I mean to be honest, you know, the hindsight and all that, you know. It, To be honest, people have asked me this question loads of times, and it's something that I try not to think too much about because I just I, I don't like to sort of think about what if. I just think, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, 
whatever's happened has happened. It's about how you react from that and, and you know, the things you do after because I can't change what happened. I can't change, you know, the injuries that I got. I can't change how well I was doing. And then, you know, it went from that to what it did. The only thing I could affect then is, you know, what happened after. Um, mm. And I just did everything in my power to, to get myself uh, back to a, a decent level and give myself the best chance to, you know, play yeah. and do as, as much as I could. Um, and I think it's, you know, people sort of sometimes underestimate, um, you know, injuries and, and, you know, maybe at times in my career, especially I've had, um, you know, clubs that I've been to where, I've, you know, I've thought, you know, opportunity and people just not giving you that, you know, little bit of a chance where I think sometimes you, you need that little bit of luck as well, massively, you know, you need to be in the right place at the right time. Um, a lot of players you see you know, get that opportunity is through you know another player maybe getting injured or something like that. It's about and when you do get that opportunity and when you do get that chance, you, you've got to try and take it because they don't come round too often. You know you've got to make sure that you you're ready and you know when you do get a, an opportunity to to sort of stake a claim and, and make an impact or you know at least show that you, you you're doing the right things. You've you've got to make sure that you're there to do it. Mm, yeah. I totally agree. There's a few more questions on that, Phil. But um, wow, we've done one hour twenty five, guys. Still tons of you watching. Please smash that like. Um, as I said before, it does help with our algorithm. And uh, Phil will come back if you keep smashing like. We'll get Phil back on. <laughs> he won't come on if you don't like us. <laughs> That's what he told me. I'm only joking. Um, usually, the last ten minutes of uh, Jarvis Corner. Uh, we don't want to keep you too long, Phil, because I appreciate you've got family and that. Uh, yeah. It's Q&A, and we've got loads of questions in. So yeah. uh, we'll start with Ian, Ian McDonald's question. He starts with, uh, and I better put it on screen, Anna Jarvis. Crikey. You're going to sack me now, aren't you? Oh, no, 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 it's okay. Sack for not putting the questions on screen. <laughs> uh, what up, folks? My question is, can this be fixed, and why has nothing changed when Sir Jim Ratcliffe says he will uh, dictate how we play is this his vision? Um, Jarvis, I'll give you that. Well, I don't know what's, what Jim Ratcliffe's uh, vision is. He, he's, he's spoken about he want to bring uh, the British back to Man United, uh, for example, British players. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't know. I haven't seen much from Nice, so I'm, I'm not quite sure about this question, what his vision actually is. I, I think he wants Man United back to to what we use, uh, what we are used to uh, to see with Man United. Not the same uh, draws from the last twelve years, but um, I, I, I couldn't give you a, a good answer on this one. Uh, maybe you guys who read the British press every day know more about Jim Ratcliffe. Great, uh, look, it's a great question. It's a difficult question to answer, though. I think that's the uh, the key elements. Um, depending on what uh, you read. Uh, the vision for Sir Jim is to make it a more English-based club for players, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I think time, unfortunately, time's going to tell on that, but great question. Mm -hmm. um, Phil, one for you. Uh, it's from the gaffer. Uh, hi, gaffer. Uh, glad I put his question up. I would have been in trouble. For, I'd have been fired for definite. Uh, <laughs> what do you think has gone wrong with Tyrell? Paul Ad must be going over a hard time mentally. 100%. I think, you know, he's been out for such a long time. Um, I don't fully know the all the ins and outs of, you know, what's fully gone on. Obviously, we know he's been out for a long while. We hear little snippets every now and again about him potentially coming back and stuff. But again, it, it's a situation where he's been out for a lengthy period of time. Um, you know, he's, he's probably doing everything he can in terms of, you know, his rehabilitation and, and um trying to get himself back in the the best uh state that he, he can in terms of when he is ready to come back but again it, it's difficult i think one thing i will say in terms of you know when i was um you know when i had my crash and my uh injury and stuff uh there was definitely not as much media attention there was definitely not as much um you know social media and stuff like that so I think in terms of for him, he's probably getting a lot more, um, you know, stuff on, on online and, and all that kind of thing, questioning maybe his, um, 
his, his, his character and his fitness because, you know, naturally fans don't sort of all understand and, and appreciate what entails with somebody who's going through a, a long-term injury. So I think for him, it is, it's going to be a difficult period. And I think, again, when he does come back, he's probably have to, he's going to have to be eased in. He won't be able to, you know, come back and, and be sort of uh, thrown straight in. So, again, it's... Difficult time for him, but hopefully, you know, we've uh, we've we've all got our fingers crossed that he can he can come back and um, you know get get himself back to a, a a level where he can affect the game because I think he's he's been missed actually with with Luke Shaw not being available. Um, you know, he he probably would have been you know playing a lot of games um, in in this last couple of months. So it's a shame. Yeah, Again, it's, it's typical. You know, when when mm. the player. You know, would be probably getting a, an opportunity. You know, he's he's not there to take it. I think football can be quite cruel at times in terms of you know timing and, and, and injuries to certain people at certain times. No, totally correct. I actually think there's a position in the club for players like yourself, Phil, that's suffered the type of injury that you did, and it could help uh, mentor and talk to uh, players coming back. Coming back, I think. Uh, the club should reach out to you on that. Just my opinion, uh, but I think it would help. Um, Jarvis got a great question from. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. We have a, a gifted membership first. Oh, sorry, from, uh, Rushman, and we just have to. I apologize. I didn't see that. <laughs> 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 thank you, Rushmano. Thank you, thank you. We have ten year membership from the legend himself, uh, Rushmano, and Milos Mitic have a new membership. Uh, Abs MUFC Lee Parker, JJFF Sam Houston, Welsh Girl sixty eight, uh, and Van Kald and Ian McDonald, Eric Ten Hag, and Giuseppe. Giuseppe Brilliant. has welcome. a new membership, so welcome to the club, guys. I hope uh, I hope you uh, will find it uh, well to be in the Man United uh, Realist TV uh, club. And uh, remember to thank Rush Mano in the chat. The legend that is Rush Mano. Thank you. Superb. Uh, great question here from uh, Craig. Craig will be a regular on the. Uh, uh, We've got Craig. Yeah, question. Uh, he said, "Question for later: Is player power the reason Eric Ten Hag is hesitant to drop or sub Rashford and Bruno? And when this ever change, as long as they are at the club, I think it's a great question. The real big debate, uh, Jarvis. I'll hand this one to you. E yes, that's a great question. I would say um, I, I got a. I was in in a uh, argument with uh, Adevale uh, Adeleke on um, on Twitter today. Um, He's the big gifter on the Noradin channel, always giving big super chats and supporting the the channel. And and uh, we talked about this actually. And and uh, he um, and he took me back to a quote from Eric Ten Hag uh, at the beginning of the season when he talked about um, Donny van de Beek. And he said um, he struggled for a long time with injury, and that was probably the main reason he wasn't playing. And then we decided to loan him in the summer, and not uh, but nothing came. And then his opportunities were so few because we made appointments and agreements with players and there were conflicts in those positions and the competition was high. So basically the, the, the statement from Eric Ten Hag has been a little bit underestimated because he talks about that they made appointments and agreements with players in that position. What do you, what do you think about uh, this? Because for me, how I interpret it is actually they are they are talking to players and say this position is yours you will fight for this position and 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 that's it and i don't like it it's too much politics i think we have lost ourselves as a club in into to uh, to this with with lawyers and politics and and agents and everybody running the club and and we have lost the vision of what's really important and that's actually winning football games so for me i think i believe full heartedly that rashford and bruno has something in their contract that that make them uh, make them uh, a priority when uh, Ten Hag picks the team. Yeah, so um, I'll just quickly uh, add to that. I totally agree. I think Sir Alex Ferguson was deafening in 2013, um, where he didn't say um, where he felt the game was going, but you could all we all knew where he felt the game was going. He felt agents were taking over the game. Phil, I'll tell you this more than anything, he'd be talking about how he despised agents uh, throughout his career. 
Mm. Uh, Paul Pogba's agent in particular hated, and uh, forgive me, I know he's no longer with us, so I don't want to um, continue down that path. But that's an example of what Sir Alex was talking about in 2013 to where we are today. Agents are by far too powerful in the modern game. Uh, players uh, roll over and allow their agents to actually dictate their career rather than the player dictating their career. And I think the difference to when Phil first had his agent <clears throat> to where we are today is cosmetic. Mm -hmm. Cos you know, it's just huge. And I just feel that um, Sir Alex, probably Wenger to an extent, saw this going. Sir Alex would never put up with it. And I think they probably realised at that time, if we carried down this path as a club, and Sir Alex realised as we time, we wouldn't get what we needed to continue to compete. And um, I think it's a big problem. Uh, I think it's a great question. And I've got absolutely no doubts that there is a, a clause in the contract that Rashford and yeah. Bruno have to start. I've got absolutely no doubts. Um, brilliant question, Craig. Thank you very much for that. I hope uh, we've answered that. Um, Phil, got another question. I've got a few questions for you here, Phil. So I'll have to push them around. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've got a question for you here. Uh, this is from the legend is Rashmana. What would you change to improve the situation? Players first out the door. So I think I think he's asking, would would it be players, or would uh, you kind of change uh, the structure above the players? Um, I think obviously every, everybody knows that. Um, there's a lot of players that are at the club at the moment who maybe need to move on, who have maybe overstayed um, the welcome, if you like, and, and maybe need to, you know, uh, go elsewhere. I think, you know, we definitely need, for me, in terms of the club now, it's massive in this next two or three years, the recruitment and, and the players that we bring in need to be, um, you know, the right players for where we want to go. I think, you know, we've seen over the last, certainly five six years that we we've, we've looked at for the best in class of who's available you know you can look at five or six players you know off the top of your head straight away and think we've played paid well over the odds they've came in and we've given 18 months two years and they've still not settled into the club and, and sort of hit the ground running and i think that kind of um situation now needs to be avoided and we need to start going for more savvy um you know not as much costing and, and players that you know are, you know we, we, you look at a lot of clubs in in the premier league and they've got brilliant recruitment teams who pick up little diamonds and, and they come in and, and sort of you know maybe take a year to settle into the premier league but then once they've got the feet under the table the the, the brilliant players and you know we're, we're paying sort of well over the odds for for people who are coming in and, and not having the impact on the team um that that we need um and not only that i think a lot of the players that we're bringing in as well aren't good role models for some of the younger players so when you're yeah. paying top dollar for for players and you you're expecting them to come in with a certain level of you know professionalism as well and they're not even doing that you know what kind of you know we were talking about it before about you know when i was at the club and i'm looking up to the first team every single player I'm looking around in the dressing room, what a role model, you know, you, you know, the, 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 you know, immaculate in every way you can think of, you know, any, um, you know, facet of the, you know, game you could look at and, and there wouldn't be, you know, a weak, a weak link. Uh, whereas now I think, you know, some of these younger players must be looking at, you know, some of these players and thinking, wow, like, you know, I know obviously nowadays there's a lot more social media and different things and this, that and the other, but the main priorities, your job is as a footballer, you know, representing Manchester United and, and giving a hundred percent every time you walk out on the pitch. And some of the players that we've we've seen aren't doing that and, and it's not acceptable. So I think in a nutshell, to, to answer that question, I think we need to get rid of a lot of the uh, players that haven't got that mindset and mentality to be a Manchester United player. And then also moving forward, we need to be a lot more savvy with the recruitment and make sure we bring in the right people mm -hmm. into the club to, to sort of bridge that gap and, and get us to, you know, where, where we need to be. 100%. Well, it's looking like 
uh, the club is trying to uh, shoehorn Jason Wilcox, isn't it, at Southampton? Looks like yeah. he's resigned and, and that's happening. Uh, maybe Dan Ashworth will be next, I think, if we can get a resignation with no fee for Wilcox. Maybe they may pay the fee for Ash uh, Ashworth, it depends. Uh, Jarvis, yeah. your fa- got your favourite question of all time. <laughs> the one you, you're the one you love answering the most. And this is from Simon. Now, I believe Simon, by the way, is a and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think Simon's a Manchester City fan, but very supportive, okay, cool. very supportive of our channel, very supportive of our channel. So, Simon, if you're still in the chat, mate, just confirm or deny uh, I've got that right. I've just got this feeling that you are, but you're very, very supportive of our channel. So we thank you uh, for that. Uh, very well balanced in his views as well. Never, uh, never. A blue, always a, a a very well balanced opinion. Question mm-hmm. is, uh, well, in fact, it's two questions. Do you feel Eric should stay or think he should go? Now, I know you've got a, a, a many viewpoints on this, Jarvis, but I think mm-hmm. you clarified your position on Nuridin's show, didn't you, a couple of days ago? So perhaps you could uh, let Simon and Phil and everyone else know your thoughts. Yeah, I've never been a big fan of the Eric Ten Hag in or out debate because I think it's it's too simple in or out. You have to see the nuances in it. Um, but, uh, you know, in lately, especially after the, the last uh, draws of a game when we lost or we didn't lose, it was 1-1, we had a draw. But um, it's it's um, for me, it looks like Ten Hag lacks the, the, the kahunas to, to, to run a big club like Man United. He looks, uh, he looks a little bit stiff on the sidelines. I, I don't think he has the, 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 the freedom to express himself as a manager. I, I, I would like to see a more bold um, uh, selection from, uh, from his teams. And I would like to see more dramatic um, changes during the game the in-game management uh, per se if, if you understand because sometimes you have to take uh, bold decisions to to win games and and i think he's, he's too careful and he looks a little bit scared sometimes and and it makes me think maybe he don't have the mindset to be a man united manager there's no doubt in my mind that ten hag has the tactical knowledge the know-how and and you know I think he's a brilliant manager, but but having the having the the courage to be a Man United manager is something different. And and I think he's I'm not quite sure. I I I, I, I wish that he would grow into the role in a way, but but I haven't seen it. We saw bits bits of uh, pieces uh, from the Liverpool game when he threw the kitchen sink and everything at the game to win it and this is what I would like to see more of but yet again when we go back to the league he comes back to being a coward in a way and and he has to he has to change that for me to assess him and for me to say Eric Ten Hag should stay he need to show more guts that's that's it no, that's uh, f- fair words that is fair words uh, Rajat comes in with a question uh, which I'll take if uh, you don't mind, guys. Will it be realistic to sign Jao Neves, uh, Ineachio, by the looks of that, Porro, Orkini, Neto? Um, who the hell is Girazi? Never heard of him. Or Antonio Silva, every two, three windows. Uh, Roger, yeah, the answer to that would be that would be yes. Uh, it's possible to sign any player uh, at any given time uh, over a two to three year period. It's whether or not those players fit into the manager's uh, way of thinking, whether or not he likes those players, or even if those players want to come to Manchester United. So in answer to your question, yes, it is possible. Uh, realistic, one would doubt it. But uh, a good question nonetheless. Um, what I like about the question more than anything is the thought of the players that you feel will fit Manchester United. So that, that to me is uh, massively interesting. So I'm going to take a couple, uh, a look at it, like, for example, Giracy, for example. So I'll have a look at him mm. um, and just to see uh, where he would fit into the club. So great question, actually. Really, really good question. Um, Phil. Barman says, uh, were you ever coached for specialist situations like blocking at the back uh, and immediately after scoring or similar? Um, I think what he's trying to say is I think he's getting at our inability to hold 
for a period of time after um, conceding a goal. I don't think he's talking specifics. Yeah, yeah no, I, I don't think um, we would never do any sort of specific training drills or anything in terms of like, once you've scored, how do you react? I think it was more of a just, you make sure, you know, you switched on, make sure everyone's... Um, in the mindset of, you know, this next two or three minutes now, we need to make sure we stay concentrated and, and just manage the game. And obviously, depending on what kind of period of the game that you're in, I mean, the, the prime example is the other day against Brentford, you score in injury time, you know, or you score in the last minute, you make sure that you shut up shop and that, you know, everyone's on the same page, you know, you you, you know nonsense, you don't take any risks at the back. You just clear your lines and you see the game out and you get over the line any needs by any means necessary. Um, I think, again, it just comes down to, you know, your own personal um, know-how and your own personal sort of knowledge of, of the game and, you know, what what's the right decisions were to be, making mm. sure that everybody's sort of, you know, on the same hymn sheet in terms of, you know, this is the last five minutes of a game. We're winning one nil. We need to make sure that this game's wrapped up and there's no risks being taken, and that we're all sticking together as a unit, and we're not going gun ho and leaving gaps and giving a chance for another team to to sort of, you know, get a result. You know, obviously things can happen. You know, if it, if if the goal would have been like you know 25, 30 yarder, and he's just smashed one in from the top corner, you you can sort of hold your hands up in that situation and be like. Do you know what? Fair play. It's an unbelievable goal. But I think because of the way it was um, it was scored, where Tony's had enough time to get it under control in the box, he's took two or three touches, and then there's been a cut back into the penalty area uh, in the penalty spot, and there's no one within five yards. It's just like, come on, like you've got to smell the danger and just be a little bit more on the ball. So I think in terms of the way that we seem to switch off and not smell smell that danger is, is worrying for me. Mm. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree. Uh, great question, uh, Baham. I hope that um, uh, answers uh, your question. Uh, <laughs> Jarvis, <laughs> they're on the go at you over the manager today, aren't they? Lucky yeah. seeing all this question to you, pal. So yeah. okay, disappointed. How do you feel? <laughs> I answered in, in, in the chat. I, I don't know okay. I'll get anywhere near my club, to be honest. I, I, I don't rate him as a manager, and, and I think there's so many other managers I would choose before him. And uh, if it was up to me, I would go for someone like... Um, I, I like this Michel, who who uh, is the coach for uh, Girona. I like his style. Yeah. It's, it's it's kind of a four four two, but he plays with overloads on the wings, crosses, and um, and uh, trying to keep possession and control of the game, uh, but not at all costs. And and I think it's kind of similar what we are used to a little bit with the with the Alex Ferguson. So. Um, but I don't know his, his mindset, his mentality and, and stuff like that. But as a tactical choice, I would go for someone like uh, Michelle. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Phil, uh, Georgie Best, massive uh, supporter of the channel. Um, really good guy. Uh, wants to know your thoughts uh, on Luke Shaw. He's had similar issues. Do you think it, it, there's a comparison between... Uh, not the actual injuries your accident and the horrific leg break that he suffered, but do you think Shaw's still suffering from uh, that leg break? He, he might well be. I think, you know, when you do suffer such a, a bad injury, um, it does have long-term effects on you. Um, mm. And because you obviously have, have sort of suffered such a serious injury, um you know, that can have then have knock on effects on other parts of it and, and, and other injuries may occur because of, of sort of you know that part of the body being maybe a little bit weaker. Um it does it just the, the way the body works, you know, if, if you're not fully functioning at um you know a hundred percent all over then you know mm. that, that is sort of something that can happen, especially at elite level football when you know your body's getting put through um the amount of stress and, and sort of work rate that you, you need to, to sort of function. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that is, you know, you know, partly to do with why he is sort of um, 
having sort of reoccurring injury issues. Um, to be honest, it happened with myself. Obviously, I I had uh, quite a few injuries through my career, not always related to obviously the, the car crash. But you know, if you look back and maybe look at some of the injuries that I have, that could have probably been linked to um, you know the the injuries that I suffered when I was uh, you know seventeen. And again, you know that that is part and parcel of um, being a footballer. You know, you do put your body through a lot. Um, yeah. And it is, it is, um, it is, you know, a, a big sort of sacrifice, really. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if, if you know, the likes of Shaw and other players who's had, you know, serious injuries, um, are linked in it in some way to, to so why, why he keeps breaking down. Maybe, mm. you know, every few months. It's not ideal. I think it's, it's one of them situations where sometimes it's, you do need a little bit of luck, um, but you are putting your body through um a lot and, and obviously there's quick turnarounds you know sometimes you're playing like two three games a week the body doesn't really get a fully chance to recover um yeah. and then obviously that's when you know things like that can happen because you you sort of not fully functioning so yeah difficult question really to sort of because i'm not a you know i'm not a physio or i don't know all the ins and outs of the sports science and stuff but mm. I don't think it takes a um, you know a scientist to, to understand that if you do have a serious injury, that is going to have you know um, other effects moving forward um, in some some capacity. Mm. That's a superb answer. Thanks, thanks very much. Hope that answers your question, George. Craig's come in with another question. Have we all heard of the English manager from Wem, uh, Rem, uh, which is uh, Will Still? We have. Yes, uh, we've spoken about him, I believe, uh, Craig. Um, his main issue was that the club was getting fined on a regular basis because he didn't have anywhere near the uh, required qualifications to lead a team uh, in the French uh, league. On, but uh, my understanding is he's very tactically astute, and yes, he's uh, he did a few interviews actually on Talksport about his role and how it came about. But uh, he's going to be a sought-after manager, but. Um, he may well be one for the future, uh, but certainly not for the present because I don't I don't believe right now. Jarvis might be able to correct me if I'm wrong here that he has some necessarily qualif necessary qualifications to actually stand in the dugout properly. If he got them anywhere near the Champions League, I I, I don't think he'd be able to <laughs> take the uh, touchline. So that's my uh, understanding of Will still. Yeah, yeah, I I have nothing to add. That's a brilliant. Uh... Brilliant uh, answer, Phil. Lovely. I've got another question, and this is to me is a superb question, and I wanted to keep this uh, for a bit later on because I think this is a brilliant question, and it's about trust. Do you trust the club medical department and assessment, or do players go and seek second opinions? And I think he's looking at Terrell Malassi a bit. I think it's a great, great question as a player. Do you, sorry to not give you this question, uh, James, but I think it's a really good question for Phil. No, that, that is a good question. Um, I think for me, uh, personally, I, I never did. Um, I think because I was at such a young age, I think I just, you know, was was left and, and trusted the club uh, wholeheartedly that they would do uh, their utmost to, to sort of get me back to, to playing football. Um, but I can totally understand as an established player, you know, in the first team and obviously being a little bit older that you may... Um, query you know what's being said at times if if you know you're thinking that you should be maybe at a certain point and you're not quite there for whatever reason um that that's definitely something that i know players have done um who, I, who i've um you know spoken to injuries about and, and i've seen that definitely happen before where players will go and, and sort of seek further opinions or you know advice about um where where maybe they can uh, see the self or you know why are they not at the position that they maybe think they should be um so yeah i, I could totally understand if if malassia has done that because he has been out for uh, a long time and there's not really sort of been any um you know major progress in terms of you know when he's going to be back in training or when he's you know going to be back available so mm. i think it, it is a frustrating one and as a player there, there's nothing worse than you know, sitting in the treatment room and not being able to be out with the lads and, and training and in the changing room. So, 
yeah, I, I, I can definitely see that he, he may want to go and, you know, seek. And and again, sometimes it's just for peace of mind. They may, they, they may you know, do something and, and just tell you the exact same what you've already been told, but at least, you know, then you've, you've had that second opinion and somebody's sort of confirmed and clarified what the situation is and you've got a little bit more peace of mind and you can sort of be a little bit more at rest then with, you know, the whole situation, whereas sometimes you maybe do get a little bit blasé with, you know, the, the, the sort of physios and the club telling you where you're at and you're not really fully understanding everything. Um, so, again, it, it is something that definitely will will happen because players inevitably want to be playing football and back on the pitch as soon as they can. So, yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's uh, probably a, a relevant situation really at the moment for, for somebody like Malassia who's been out for such a long mm. time. Yeah, well, well answered. Well, the gaffer himself, Jarvis, as uh... yeah, I, I just want to add to this because we read, we read <laughs> about the tabloid press about the our medical team getting a lot of um, criticism. Yeah. But the thing is, we got to remember we all we always have like patient doctor confidentiality, and into this, it's hard for the medical team to defend themselves, and we don't know what's going behind the scenes, what they actually have done, how many players they have, in a way. Uh, rescued from from injuries and and we only hear the 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 bad stories so it's very hard sitting on the outside criticizing the the medical team and and i think they are uh, they are um, they have a lot of experience they have been doing this for a lot of years it's and now we have the the arsenal guy coming in and and you know we didn't headhunt him for uh, because really, he was yeah. bad you know we we had to hunted him for a reason so I think maybe this is one of those seasons where everything went wrong. And um, yeah, I don't know. But what I can complain about is I don't think the Glazers have put many a lot of money into the, to the science, the sports science, the medical science. And we all remember the story about Ronaldo. He didn't get the, his ice bath. He needed to, to bring his own when he came back to United. And, you know... We need to put money into this and and be the best club in the world when it comes to to uh, recovery and and uh, rehabilitation. So um, that's maybe the thing we we as fans could criticize when it comes to the medical team. I think um, one of the big issues we had have is that we had to deal with Toshiba, uh, and they supplied all our medical equipment. Mm. Um, and if you look in the <laughs> In the current state of Toshiba, it's not uh, not so clever. So I'm not saying that's not state it, of the art, uh, but it could well be that we've got old equipment and they haven't been able to replace it. Um, the, the gaffer Jarvis has popped up with uh, five memberships, so we'll just give you the blue sunnies. <laughs> oh God, is that a new one? It's getting worse. <laughs> Damn, no, no, this is the best one I have. Crikey. We have. Five new members. Thank you, Mick Ruby, for gifting five memberships. We have Nick S. Belfast Man United Therapy Reactions. We have uh, Rich Club Sports, Jay and Wesley Jesse. So uh, welcome to the club. Absolutely superb. Guys, we are approaching a mammoth two hours, so I think we'll run with uh, two more questions. And one of them is specifically for, for me from Trevor uh and we'll uh we'll do that in a minute uh so last question uh jarvis i'll let you take this one if you have to choose about buying a bench striker or a right winger starter uh who would you choose, or what Ooh, would you choose? that's a difficult one I, um, I, know, I know that's why i gave it you yeah <laughs> no uh, <laughs> No, no, I didn't mean it like that. No, no, you you've let me off the hook there, mate. I have let you off the hook, yeah, too right. <laughs> also, we'll put Jarvis on the fish hook for that one. Yeah, yeah, we, but uh, it depends. But uh, for me, I think uh, I think we need a bench striker more than a right winger at the moment. Um, we have Garnacho and we have a couple of guys out on loan. We have Ahmad, so so we can fill that gap for at least next season, I believe. But the bench uh, striker is more important because actually now, if Hoylund gets injured, we have no one. We can play with Ahmad or Bruno as the false nine, so we can't rely on that for a full season. So a bench striker for me. Excellent. Um, and the final question, good old Trevor. 
Most important question of the night. Tipton Town, the mighty. You forgot to put the mighty in there, Trev. Come on, come on. Not just Tipton Town or Manchester United. Uh, think long and hard. Yeah, well, difficult, difficult question as I grace uh, the mighty Tipton Town's pitch on the weekend. But um, Manchester United all day long. But a support since I was seven, Trev. Uh, first game at uh, Wolves away uh, back in 1977, mate. All those years, so uh, my wow. allegiance will always be to the to the Grandmasters of Manchester United. I'm a 30 year old this year, season ticket holder. If I uh, renew, so uh, platinum holder. Uh, although I don't get to go anymore, my lad goes. But Trevor, I hope that answers your question. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, big question, Stu. Do you play on AstroTurf or natural gra grass? Uh, we do both, actually. We do both. We we play on a Saturday and a Sunday, or a Sunday, because depending on which pitches are available for us. So we don't play on park pitches or anything like that. Mm. Our, our, our old limbs couldn't do that. So uh, so we play on AstroTurf or... I mean, but we play it. You know, we play at stadiums like Worcester Warriors or Six Way Stadium that is, you know, in, in Worcester and... We played at St George's Park occasionally, just depending uh, who we're playing and, and, and what pitches are available. So it is a mixture. So, uh, but we do play 90 minutes uh, as well. Um, so it's all good. It's all good. But, you know, at our tender age, I'm 54 now. And you do feel it for a couple of days after, trust me, <laughs> when, you, uh, when you're playing. Are you, you back playing yet, Phil? Or? Um, I'm, to be honest, I'm I'm not far away now. I'm, I'm sort of ready maybe to to sort of give it a go, albeit there's only probably half a dozen games left of the season. So uh, yeah, I'm 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 not far away at all now. I'm just I'm just sort of gradually getting there. I, I didn't want to rush back obviously after being out for so long and, and obviously the injury that I had I didn't want to sort of you know come back too soon and end up sort of making things uh worse. So I'm just being a little bit more cautious. I think because I'm getting a bit older now, Stu, you know what it's like. You've got to yeah. be a little bit more, um, you know, astute with with, with uh, when you, you sort of body feels like you're ready to go back. But yeah, hopefully get a couple of games in before the end of the season and then get a good pre-season in me and, and hopefully be good to go again next year. Maybe Do one more you, one more season. One more season, is it? Will you go up or will you still be in the North Northwest Carolina? Uh, no, I think, no, I think this year it will be... Uh, there's no chance of going up or down. It's just sort of um, give it another go next year. To be honest, the, the league uh, this year has been been quite competitive. I think Barry are uh, going to go up this year. Um, but luckily, I think there's only the, the leagues are changing again. So there's only one team going this year. So they're always, they're always changing and different, you know, sort of legislation and stuff. So I don't know what's happening, but I think only one team's going up and one's going down. So. Oh, yeah, man. it's it's the northwest counties. I mean, we have a couple of teams from our from where I live, uh, like Wem Town play Northwest and um, Ellesmere Town. Uh, I think Oswald Street played Northwest as well, Northwest oh, County. Yeah. So, yeah, so I don't think they're Premier League, I think they're Division One or whatever it is. But there's that many leagues now. I think there's, I think there's like five or six different leagues in the northwest counties, and then obviously you've got the Premier Division, which is like, um. You know the one we're in at the minute, but as I say, I don't know what's fully happening next year. There's this sort of uh, stuff happening with the league situation. So as I say, I think there's only one team going down and one going up. So there must be a bit of a reshuffle again. Um, but it's happening all the time at the minute with with all the leagues. To be honest, in the in the sort joke, of, it? it's, a joke. Not, it's it's ridiculous. But hey, they're trying, to, they're trying to get away with uh, step eight, nine, and whatever, aren't they? To a certain extent, they're trying to push everything to step seven and step six, and yeah. you know that which is fine. And then you've got to take that huge step up to step five, yeah. which is uh, which is almost impossible, isn't it, for a team? You know, yeah, from the northwest counties prem, it's almost impossible. Yeah, yeah. You can't do it. So. Yeah. Yeah, the football pyramid in the UK is rubbish. Uh, a couple of extra little bits. <laughs> yeah, we've got to put this. Does anyone remember Chris Eagles? Oh, God. So, so I, if you listen to... You do. You definitely do, yeah, don't you? I do, yeah. Chris, good lad, to be fair, Chris. Um, I, the story everyone always remembers about him is when he, when he made his uh, first team debut or a couple of games into him being involved with the first team and he came down with his flip-flops and his headband on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone was going out for a walk and 
the, the lift door opened and he walked out and Sir Alex just gave him the stairs if to say, get up back upstairs and get you, you know, <laughs> get, get that Alice band off and get some bloody trainers on. <laughs> didn't, he get, didn't he get slaughtered for missing a penalty in pre-season in South Africa as well? Yeah, yeah, I think didn't, so. Yeah. Didn't, didn't he had ben, a few ben Foster missed one and he got yeah. raised, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, to be honest, he was because uh, he was uh, from London. He had, he was a little bit more flash, and he had a little bit more of a swagger about him. He was a great lad, don't get me wrong. And he and he, he always uh, put a shift in, and there was no qualms that he was a, a great player. And he he, he, always, he just he just had uh, that little bit of um, extra, you know, where some of the first team players would would always be on the lookout for some of the younger players who had you know you know stay in your lane, don't be getting ahead mm. of yourself. Flash yeah. cars, you know, Alice bands and <laughs> earrings and all that kind of thing. So he, he was one who was sort of on the hit list a little bit with uh, with some of them. But <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to be the next Beckham, wasn't he? Bless him. Yeah, he loved he loved Bex. To be fair, I think obviously, it. yeah, I think he was like his idol. So you can sort of uh, understand maybe a few of the little things that he had going on like the headband and the earrings and stuff so. yeah it ruined his career though didn't he that was the thing you know he, he, if he'd stayed like you say if he'd stayed in his lane he was a very talented player uh yeah he was, was, wasn't good. Really yeah, good was ball. yeah really, really good players i say I, I played with him a lot in the uh in the youth team and then in the reserves and stuff and he, he was a brilliant player loads of energy mm -hmm. you know great great right foot on him you know, set pieces and stuff, really good deliveries. And as I say, he, he had a brilliant engine. He was only one of uh, two or three players that I ever saw who completed the bleep test, like completely wow. finished it. Um, so that, yeah, yeah, that, that was, you know, as a young player, that was, you know, something that, you know, a lot of the first team and, and the, the, the sort of management in the first team was massively uh, impressed by I think that's what sort of put them on uh, sorry put him on on the radar early doors mm. because he was really fit very um lean and, and sort of you know agile player but again as you say sometimes it's uh about staying in your lane and just making sure that the main priority is the, the football and the again step, yeah. there's a lot of players who we could maybe speak about um at another oh, time of course, of course bundles of ability but you know didn't quite have the the mindset and didn't have the dedication and maybe you know the uh, outside distractions maybe got a little bit too uh, involved at times with certain players that sort of you know made them take the eye off the ball. Yeah, mm. it's it's a, it's a shame, but it is. Uh, one final question from uh, another legend of our channel, Phil uh, Steph Griffith. She's uh, one of our moderators and. Um, She's absolutely superb. Uh, we love her to bits on here, uh, along with the VAR room. Um, score prediction, uh, if you don't mind, Phil. And uh, you know, I, I don't. I could. I don't. Wouldn't know where to place my hat. I'm afraid on Thursday. I just don't know because <laughs> you know what you're going to get from Chelsea, do you? No, no. I think Chelsea's. You know, another team this year that have been up and down so much. It's very difficult to sort of predict what kind of a game, what kind of a result, what kind of a team selection that they've got. It's just so um, fluctuating and unknown. It's 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 very difficult. Um, I'm going to go for a 2-1 win. I think we usually just about have enough to get over the line um, against Chelsea. So I'm just going to go safe and just say a 2-1. Do you know what? Uh, that's kind of where I was leaning towards. I think um, we'll be good. I think, I think there'll definitely be a couple of goals, uh, but I'm hoping that we can just... I mean, to be honest, Chelsea, uh, when I have watched them in, in recent times, um, at the back, you, you know, if, if, you, if you're if on your game, you, you can mm. get at them and, and there's goals to be had. Um, and, then, and then at, at times, you know, going the other way, you've got Palmer, who seems to be scoring a lot of goals for them um, from well, midfield, who's the yeah. main... For me, I think he's the best player. Yeah, I think you know he's he's you know probably the best chance of of them getting some out of the game. Uh, well, we, um, we need Harry Maguire to stick him in his pocket, leave him in his pocket, and drag him up to Manchester. He'd be tremendous for us, Cole Palmer. Mm, yeah. that, that ten perfectly. Yeah, he's, he's, he's very good the team, but he would put that. He'd fit that ten super yeah. well. He would, guys. Um, 
Would you believe we've done two hours and ten minutes, give or take? So, Phil, thank you very much for your time, mate. Because uh, no not normally we try and do uh, ninety minutes on Jarvis Corner, but the questions have been absolutely top yeah. draw from the VAR room. Phil, you've been an absolute treat again, as always. Um, we'd love to have you back. Uh, yeah, no, I'd say I'm, I'm all happy to uh, jump on and, and have a chat. As I say, I enjoy uh, speaking about football, uh, yeah. regardless of whether it's about myself or whether it's just football in general. So um, if I'm ever free and available, I'm always good to, to, to jump on and have a chat. So I'm well, sure. we'll, we'll reach out again in a week or two's time, if that's all right, Phil. And just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, no well, uh, Jarvis, as it's your show, uh, old friend, I will let you thank everybody and uh, and close. Thank us you, out. thank you, Stu. Thank you, Phil, for uh, coming on. It's been a brilliant show. I just want to thank everybody in the VAR room: uh, Jamie Wayne, Lucky Singh, Stephanie Griffith. Always keeping the count. I think we are on uh, sixty-two likes at the end of the show. Okay. That's fantastic, okay. guys and girls. And if you haven't uh, hit that the like, please do. And uh, I just want to thank Yala, Craig Warby, Lilis, Mick Ruby in the chat. Thank you for watching Mick Ruby. And there's uh, so many of you, so uh, and yes. all the brilliant comments. Uh, so thank you for uh, watching and tuning in. And we will be back with Jarvis's Corner next Monday, 9 p.m. So uh, have a good one, guys. See you on the next. Thank you so much for stopping by and watching MUFC Realist TV. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on the socials.